All right, King Killers, we're covering chapters 66 through 70 in this episode. We talk about how the mayor brings on Kavoth to pick up his aunt, uh, how Kavoth can't create without Denna, and we get the legendary walk through the gardens. Uh, we also are going to discuss some pranks that we used to like to play, some weird things you could do with ears, and more clues to the majorly important bathroom break theory. So sit back and enjoy. <laughs> All right, welcome back, King Killers, to the King Killer Podcast. Dan got with me, Boomer Tim. How you doing, Boomer? Hey. I'm good. Struggling. Doing all right. Struggling to identify the difference between Instagram and Twitter still? <laughs> uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to use my Tom Tom to get directions in the car. Yeah, he's still Tim. Is that the original one? That wasn't the Tim, original. Tim one. gets hung up because he, he's, he's still got like a flip phone, and he sees everybody else with their iPhones and their like put touch screen, and so he's always touching his screen and getting very frustrated. <laughs> so he can't figure out his flip phone is not a touch screen. Yeah, I just roll my finger across the screen like I don't, I don't get this. I don't get this. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, what was before Tom Tom? What was I don't can't remember now. Like. What was like the original navigation? There was there was one that had name recognition. I don't know, just maps. No, I mean I had a Thomas guide yeah. when I first moved to Los Angeles. I'd had it on my lap. Oh man, those were terrible days. Yeah. You had to look at fucking yeah. maps and kind of guesstimate where you were. Like if you're driving cross country and you're like, I think we're somewhere about here. So well, you, well, soon you, <laughs> we're gonna be coming up on a turn can't quite well, tell what the turn is well it was all about i mean the, it was all about you know mile markers and uh exit you know exit numbers yeah the freeway i mean it, it helped but it's it was interesting it's very interesting to move from like a place like indiana to los angeles and then try to just get around and go from like manhattan beach and try to get back to freaking the valley at four o'clock not knowing oh yeah traffic I remember one of our buddies one time asking how to get to uh my house and i was like all right you need to go down and then i started thinking about it. i was like man i don't know any of the streets you turn on i don't know what any of the names are <laughs> i was like all right you're gonna go to the the fourth turn and you're gonna make a right on that the fourth oper fourth right you have you're using like land make a right yeah. yeah i had to like just go off the numbers like Make the fourth right, then the third left, then the second right, and then down at the corner. Just get on. You should be. A, they, yeah, just get on the uh, get on the one hundred and one and exit at the McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's helpful. It's like man, <laughs> I, I, you know, you get so used to, especially if it's not if you like move to a place and you haven't lived there for you know years and years and years. Especially nowadays, like, what? Who cares what the other street names are? Like, what does that matter? If you know how to get home, like, you're not. Why? What is that yeah, information it, is not important. And so, like, yeah, once no, you funny. know the I, turns, I, I have, you just make the turns and don't even think about the names. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of trouble remember a lot of street names around my my area because I don't I don't use them. Yeah, I know how to get there. I mean, I don't need directions, no. man. <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it, it's funny having people come in town and you know, trying to help them out. I'm like, uh, maybe I'll just, just drive. I'll just drive. Fuck it, put it in your your Google. Why, like, why are you even asking me directions yeah. in this day and age? That's the other part. I of texted it, yeah. you my address. Yeah. Why do you need me to vocalize the directions? This is outdated information. I always I always loved going out in like Hollywood, and somebody'd be like, "All, all right, so I know where we're going. Where am I going to park?" <laughs> I don't know, man. Where are you yeah. going to park? I don't know. I'm going to figure out once I get there. Well, just let me know once you get like I'm not fucking doing that. I'm not keeping you yeah. posted on the parking situation. Like, fuck this shit. 
Yikes. Maybe you should just stay home. Just stay home. You don't have to deal with parking. It's fine. Like I, I'm, <laughs> I'm the worst one to ask because like I'll, I'll park so far away if I see a spot just and it's, it's like there yeah. and it's like, I don't know if there's going to be spots further up. It's just like, well, I'll just park here. Yeah. And then I'll walk, walk. I seven blocks. <laughs> like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> care about that. It's like, who cares? As long, yeah. The, the key is as long as you're not in a garage, you know, cause a lot of times who knows how late you're going to be out and then, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to get my car tonight. Yeah. That'll be tomorrow. I mean, good way to prevent drinking and driving, I guess, but you know, not super convenient for the uh, the next day. Nah, if I'm worried about parking, yeah, I'm just fucking Ubering it. But yeah, well, that didn't exist at the time of at the time of Thomas Guide either. So, well, good shit together. Should have invented it. You see, you see, here's what happens. You call me a boomer, and here we are talking about parking, yeah. <laughs> and like driving and nav in in directions. Yeah, I'm trying what, to bring it down like? to what was the weather down like to your level, today? man. Fucking keep you involved. <laughs> Start talking about hashtags and fucking your brain's gonna short circuit. Nice. Uh but yeah, so we are starting with chapter sixty six this episode. So sixty six is titled Within Easy Reach. In this chapter, Kaboth is in his new digs, his new room, playing his music, and the mayor sneaks in through the uh, back entrance, has him play some music for him, and uh, tests him on his skills to be able to pick up Malewin for him, and then Kaboth ends up having a little get-together with Denna. Yeah, well, and it's not really, it seems like not just room, it's rooms. Right, yeah. his, his his area that he gets is so massive that um, he he doesn't even know what to call his rooms. He's like, I guess this is the sitting room, and he's like, well, this is where I I played my loot, I guess. Uh, and he's got nice wines, like he's got a he's got a nice situation going here. Yeah, and uh, we get we get a little reminder that the mayor was uh, was very very serious about hooking old boy up for what he had done for him, which is still interesting because that kind of on rereads, we know that doesn't really pan out, you know? Like, he didn't get to fully capitalize on what he did, he, which is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, he de- I mean, he definitely know. doesn't get... It's I mean, for, he, story. for everything he does for the mayor, he doesn't get much of a reward for it. I mean, it, it's a it's a solid reward. It's not nothing. I mean, he's getting his tuition paid, and that's yeah. obviously been a massive problem for him. For And not only is well, he yeah, getting his tuition that- paid, he's making money off of his tuition now. So, well, and he, he's he's basically got like a writ of patronage, right? Where he can basically no, he doesn't have it. He, he's he doesn't get a writ of uh, patronage. He's he's able Didn't to he play. Similar, he's though? able to play in places, but he specifically does not get a writ of uh, patronage. No, he doesn't get a. The uh, mayor is not his patron after this. So I guess it's more just um, financial backing. Yeah, like he has the mayor's permission to be able to play you know where he wants but that's it he doesn't like he's not in the in the mayor's service so big difference yeah i mean well it, it, and it's and it's his temper well that's where it comes from again that's what cost him but whatever i mean it's good for the story and the fact that like how it works out but on the rereads it's interesting be, to be confronted with it because you almost forget or at least i forgot to a degree how much the mayor was like, dude, he was going to make him a duke, right? He's going to give him land and like a castle and, you know, he, he'd have a title, you know, where now he has sway in the world. Yeah. And he'd rival to a degree, he rivals people like, you know, Sam and uh, Ambrose and whatnot. Yeah. And now, you know, and then at that point, he actually has a name for himself and can sort of build off that. But that that's all goes by the wayside. Yeah, it gets blown up. But yeah, so he's he's sitting there playing his music and Mayor comes in through a, a secret passage that links his room to Kavot's room, which is one of the reasons that he put him in the, the new digs is there's a, a secret entrance between the two so he can sneak in and pop in and have conversations with him whenever he wants. And the mayor starts, you know, kind of testing him like what what you know, what was that you were playing just now? And uh, it wasn't 
really a proper song your grace i was just playing the mayor raised an eyebrow it was of your own devising i nodded in emotion to me i'm sorry to have interrupted you please continue what would you like to hear your grace i have it on good report that malowin lackless is fond of music and sweet words he said something along those lines and then so we he plays some music for him a few different songs he plays like the uh, lay of sir Savian trailer i believe and a violet by yeah and so which we've heard about a couple times he uh yeah he he shows you know the mayor that he his talent is not overblown that he's as good as you know he says he is yeah i like i like that the whole way it, it comes out we get to see his his sort sort of how he warms up how he gets his uh, little warm up going when he plays um and he starts with Ten Tata Tornin, which is, uh, if I remember right, that's like one of the most difficult songs to play, which I think he plays and makes it look easy. Yeah. That whole back and forth. Yeah. So he basically plays that to warm up. And then, um, you know, he, I like, I love the way Rothfuss describes it because he gets to the point where like he has his feet up and my music was mellow and content as a cat in a sun, sunbeam. And then that's when the mare comes in. So you get this feeling that he's just kind of, he's letting it flow out of him. We always, it's so great because we had that basis from like the beginning chapters in book one where he's stuck in the woods and he creates, right? He just, he basically is his own jam band and just creates these sounds. And with all that, that knowledge and experience um, in these circumstances, we get to feel like what he's probably just playing when the mayor comes in probably sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's. I mean, he's uh, he's playing extremely difficult songs to play in that ten tatatorum and and lay of Sir Savian Trailyard. I mean, those are mentioned specifically as being extremely difficult songs to play. So, yeah, he's showing off a bit, showing you know, showing the mayor that well, he's as good as they say. The, the funny thing is, he, he plays ten tatatorum just to warm up before the mayor's even there. So he's oh, just that's like, before the mayor's that, there. That's, okay. So he didn't yeah, play for that's what him. I was saying. I, yeah, and that's what I was saying. I kind of I like that we get that that picture of him just like playing for himself because we don't get a lot of that, which I was actually a bit surprised of when he was in his room by himself and he had the loot. It's like, dude, he does have things he can do. I guess he just wasn't feeling it, you know. Well, like the, he, at he, first he, more, he uh, didn't have his loot. Well, no, I know, but once he does, he still has frustrated times where he's just in there stewing about the mayor thinking, um, you know, he's at fault for him being. Yeah, prison, but I mean, uh, he's right, also dying. in a situation there where he's like, "Are they going to kill me? Yeah. Is the mayor going so to survive? Not, Are they going to murder me?" Maybe it's not really the yeah. time to make a mix. CD. Like he started playing. <laughs> he's like one time he started playing his music and he started playing "Leave the Town Tinker." Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's getting those those subtle reminders from his subconscious of like, uh, I need to get the fuck out. Yeah, of Yeah, it's like got guards at his door and shit. And so yeah, his his situation was quick quickly uh, devolving. So yeah, that's it's not a uh, prime position to be just kicking back and relaxing playing music. I, I like their where it goes with their back and forth because basically through this him playing for the mayor, the mayor's like, oh, so. Threp wasn't exaggerating. You're you're as great as, or you're you're built up. He built you up in a way that was accurate. And then they talk about basically their situation, where they're going to go with it. I like um, I, I like that. Basically, Kavoth goes as far as like, look, man, I I can I can do this, but just learning of her history, that's not going to be enough to like you know get this woman to fall in love. And I like that he's uh, Alvaron's like, yeah, you must take me for a fool. Because when he when I read that, I was like, well, I did too, because <laughs> I I didn't know he had more you know more in mind. And then we find out he's about to meet her in a couple of days or whatever. Yeah, she's coming in a couple of days, and they're gonna have a month long celebration to celebrate the passing of his Ill illness. And I, uh, the but the the idea that Kavoth is going to be the one to help. The mayor is kind of ridiculous. Oh, and you step back and you you think of how bad he is at picking up women for himself. He's not. He's I, not. Well, I mean, he is. He is very witty. He's very charming. He's very good at talking talking to women. But he's also so oblivious 
to, you know, a woman, what a woman wants and what a woman desires that it, it's, it's like, man, I don't know. I don't know if I want to, I don't want to know if I want to go hunting with a guy who's never caught his own deer. <laughs> like hey look i've knows, knows i've watched the, uh... a lot of youtube videos <laughs> and i think i know what i'm doing it's like i don't care how many hunters videos you've watched if you're not a hunter i don't know if i want you fucking going out there to hunt deer for me i i do really like this group of chapters in the sense of what you just pointed out because he's still stumbling on himself he still doesn't fully get it he's getting better and Rothfuss did a great job of showing how he's starting to get better at just learning how, because even with Mellowin, he even goes as far as stating the more she talks, the more I'll learn about her. I'm like, there you go, bro. Now you're starting to get it. <laughs> now you're starting to understand how to, how to talk to women. And so he is getting there, but at the same time with Denna, um, and like his inner, his inner thoughts when he's with Denna in these chapters, he's still like stumbling and whatnot. But I think it's perfect in the sense that he's capable when he's removed, right? So when he's taught, this used to be, I mean, man, I, I was probably like 20, 21. But I remember that thing that a lot of guys say is like when they first get a girlfriend, you know, at some point where then they go out and now a bunch of chicks want to date them. You, basically, you're because you're not looking, because you're not trying, now all of a sudden you do a better job of talking to women. Yeah, it's because you don't have that that super thirsty agenda that you typically show up well, to the bar and, with. And you're not really thinking about it. You're just being yourself and relaxed yeah. and, and shit along those lines. But yes. this is a specific situation where you're telling Kavok to think about it. So it's well, no, it's not my, even my, you my can just like, ah, not... just be myself. Like, like, no, specifically go on the hunt. And this dude's not fucking shown that he can fucking hunt <laughs> like so it's no i i know i agree but the but the positive is this isn't for him if it was for him it'd be a little bit different because he's he's playing wingman yeah man, basically he's doing it in a direct manner but he's doing it also in an indirect manner in, in terms of he's doing it directly to the person that he's trying to attract but it's not denna so you know that removal can help him to be a little bit more successful. And it's also, I mean, he's writing songs, poetry, all that type of stuff. So it's a different element as well. He's not basically sitting there, you know, speaking with her. If he was trying to attract Mellowin at the table, he's charming, which he typically is, you know, and he's charming with Denna and he's already got Denna. He just doesn't fucking know it. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I see him like stumble all over himself. Like when Debbie flirts with him openly you know, yeah, or, or yeah, things along true, those yeah. lines where like, if he knows like that's what he's doing, it just seems like this would not be like his in his wheelhouse to be really good at, but you know, it's not outlandish. I mean, he's just writing music and poetry and just, you know, be, he's already a, a charming and witty guy. But yeah, I mean, I, it, what, it, what it shows you, I, you know, ultimately, if you're, just, if you just accept it, that he, he is good at it, then it, it shows you how big of a hang up his own self worth is, like how much that is holding him back, mm -hmm. his valuation yeah, well, of himself. Cause that, if, he, if he could do it for the mayor, he could do it for himself. There's that. And then there is also, he is evolving as an individual within these chapters, I mean, throughout the whole book, right? He's, he's slowly evolving and becoming somebody who is capable of more. Yeah. But when and he, even when he, it's, when it's he, fitting, he gets in, you know, he gets with uh flurry and he gets out and he starts hooking up with all the girls at the school. He's still not in a position where he, he's thinking like any of these girls want to be with him long-term. I mean, he's just yeah. thinking like, you know, he's just someone, you know, for them to have fun with, you know, periodically. And so he does not, he, he's not looking at like, you know, I'm trying to woo this girl into marriage and, and shit along those lines. Like it's doesn't even occur to him like the, you know, that he could even be in a long-term relationship and he probably wouldn't be a, an ideal candidate given how singularly focused he is on it, his mission with, of the Chandrian, but yeah. he's still, he's not, he's not even thinking along those lines. So like I, I, I and it, in this situation, he's, wooing a girl for marriage so i mean he has that in him he could find a girl like to you know settle down with and get married but 
just not he does not think of himself in that way. It's interesting though, also because he has blinders on with Denna. It seems like it's Denna or no one else. That's been since the beginning, right? So there's also that element that's sort of mixed in as well. But no, I hear you, and I, I agree with you. He does seem he does definitely lack that self worth. In obviously, he knows his worth in other ways, but in terms of a relationship, an emotional dependency relationship in itself, yeah, he just doesn't. He he's broken, and he hasn't healed from that shit. Who knows if he? Yeah. No, ever does right or will? No, and and the, I also like. Where the Mayor Alvaron was like, you know, the you you don't need anything to aid your inspiration. And he's like, I would I would have uh, your leave to freely wander the estates and sever and low according to my will, your grace. Of course, uh, of course, I gave an easy shrug. In that case, I have everything I need for inspiration within easy reach. But I like that um, when the mayor's asking him about that. And he's like, you know, not, nothing more than that. I've heard tell poets who need uh, certain extravagancies to aid in, aid them in their composition, a, a specific type of drink or scenery. I've heard of a poet quite famous in Rainier who has a trunk of uh, rotting apples he keeps close at hand. Whenever his inspiration fails him, he opens it and breathes the fumes they emit. I laughed. I'm a musician, Your Grace. Leave the poets to their superstitious bone rattling. All I need is my instrument, two good hands, and a knowledge of my subject. I love the, uh, I, I love his always shitting on poets. It always <laughs> cracks yeah. me up. It's just complete disdain for him. Even though one of his best friends is massive fan of fucking poetry, he's always shitting on it. Like it's a complete joke. It, it's, it, it's funny. His pride almost got in his way. Because luckily, Alvaron's like, well, nothing. You don't need anything. He's like, and then he goes as far as, well, I would have your leave to freely wander the estates. So he at least got that because he could have fucked up with his pride. But it's kind of funny too, the poet thing. I've I've heard of this. There's a like a 18th century German poet that did this. Exactly. Yeah. Had rotting apples in his desk. And I read about another writer experimenting with it. Didn't work for her. No. But uh, it's a dumb idea. It did work for this dude. <laughs> well, I mean, he wrote, uh, I guess what he had written, uh, I think it's Friedrich Schiller. He had written uh, like something that got used by Beethoven for like one of his famous movements. But yeah, it's, it is kind of, I mean, like smell can give you nostalgia, can give you a certain. Uh, yeah, but you smell you know, garbage. Motion. Like, mm. yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah I, I, I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel they need to vomit, and now my creative juices are just super flowing. Or like uh, the French writer Balzac, he uh, like Balzac. wouldn't sleep and like was extraordinarily addicted, like used a tremendous amount of caffeine, would drink tons of coffee to the point that he was like basically had the John Wayne, Elvis Presley deal with his bowels being all stocked up. That's how you get good writing, yeah. apparently, is just be completely stocked up with shit inside of you. That's uh, so that's you people have that have like in your you desk. have like a mental fucking problem. You need to yeah, work through that. Yeah. Or I mean, who knows? I that was one of the things. Like when I was younger, like I was a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe, and I'm like, well, this guy was tortured. Is that what you got to do to be a great writer? You got to be freaking tortured. I mean, some you like, know some of those people are, but existence. I don't think it's necessary. Like you see, like you know where things can help people, but then you know as they keep doing it over and over again, like the quality really so like chevy chase is a yeah, very good wait. example of like goes up a reaches very high heights and then just fucking falls off a cliff because it was like yeah, yeah dude you needed to fucking stop doing so much blow <laughs> this <laughs> is too much too much went way past the point That's of good. where it was uh you know juice in the brain and give, getting your creative juices flowing well, and, th and there's also the sense that, uh, well, going back to like the tortured soul type thing, it's one thing to create, you know, the type of art or writing or what what have you that lasts forever. But I mean, to sacrifice your entire experience while you're on earth is a little, that's a, a little tall there's, order. There's a happy, tall order. I still want to enjoy my life. There are happy fucking people that are creative too. That make great yeah. shit. Yeah. You don't have to be miserable. And 
as, as a matter of fact, if you can figure it out and be as healthy as possible while you're doing it, you're going to be able to create more. Yeah. Chances are, if you can really figure that out without, you know, having to rot your insides, yeah, you probably have a good shot at making this shit yeah. work. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm the the I, the idea of like just I if you're just sniffing smelly apples, rotten apples, like no, that's that's something you need to work out in your head, man. You that is not something that's necessary to be a good poet. What if he was uh, literally taking the smelly apples and chopping them up and snorting them? Well, then, yeah, combine that, the two elements: the Chevy Chase and yeah, that makes <laughs> injection sense. Injection of rotten fruit that makes sense because that <laughs> then once it gets into your system and you 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 got like about fifteen minutes before you start heaving it up, yeah, you get the pressure the pressure to get your writing done before you're clinging onto a toilet. As, now, now that I think about it, it would have been really funny. I mean, obviously it wouldn't have fit the culture or anything, but it would have been really funny if Alvaron's like, he pushes him. Well, I mean, nothing though to aid your inspiration. And Cavell's like, hookers and blow. Yeah. yeah. Nah, I'm just fucking with you. Nah, all I need is my instrument. I'm good. <laughs> oh, man. And then... Shit ton of dinner raisin. Lots of dinner. Yeah. Just need, really want to have super white teeth. And, oh, and speaking of... Uh, white teeth he goes in he sees denna he's like i barely set foot on tenery street when i saw her with all the fruitless searching i had done over the last several months it seemed odd i should find her so easily now and it says i caught up to her as quickly as i could without attracting attention excuse me miss she turned her face bright and at the sight of me yes i would i would never normally approach a woman in this way but i couldn't help but notice that you have the eyes of a lady i was once desperately in love with what a shame to love only once, she said, showing her white teeth and a wicked smile. I've heard some men can manage twice or even more. She's been she's been doing up that dinner. She's she's hooked. Yeah, you think? Yeah, she's <laughs> she's all loaded up on you dinner. Think, uh, Master Master Ash is he has another thing that keeps her yeah. around. He's yeah he's got he's sitting there. Man. One of their songs is like uh, you know cook cook crack like this except for his cook, cook <laughs> dinner like this that's one of the songs he's having her write for him it's got to be it's probably got to be one of the most effective ways for a patron of the arts to really keep that artist you know in check with them i don't know you remember uh what was it tiger king or that dude <laughs> tiger king <laughs> he was wielding those yeah fucking joe joe exotic oh i never watched that you had to have seen that. You never watched uh -huh. it? Oh man, it's great. But I mean, he basically he with pot and and uh, meth got some straight man to marry him. I mean, basically that's what it took. It was it's a crazy story. It's pretty wild. Um, I was going to say though, uh, something that Rothfuss does here that I think is pretty impressive. We've heard about Denna many fucking times, right? We've seen a lot throughout the books. He still manages to give us details about her that I, I, it's impressive to me because of the amount of times there's descriptions of Denna, but still even here, you know, 500 pages into book two, we get like Denna moved through the crowd with slow grace, not the stiffness that passes for grace in courtly settings, but a natural leisure of movement, movement. A cat does not think of stretching its stretches, but a tree doesn't, does not even do this. A tree simply sways without the effort of moving itself. This is how she moves. It's fucking, I, I love it. I think that's great. And it puts you in the moment in the terms of like he's coming up to her and that whole back and forth they have, it's it, they're back to their old ways, you know? Yeah. Uh, the one thing like on that, though, like the the tree just does its thing like the so you they, they I thought I like the cat analogy best because like the the tree is just getting blown around by the wind. It's not just doing its thing. It's getting fucking pushed around. It just can't be fucking lifted off the ground. Well, that's what he says. He says that a tree simply sways without the effort of moving itself. Yeah. So it's like the whole idea is like she's literally just in the moment is what I got out of that. That's what I got. But yeah, I, I, I like the, the I, I like their back and forth. They got, you know, where he's like, I ignored her jibe. I'm only a fool once. Never while I love again. Her expression turned soft, and she laid her hand lightly on my arm. You poor man, you must have been hurt terribly. 
Struth, she wounded me more in what was Struth? Yeah. Struth. <laughs> Tis truth, yeah. I guess. Struth. She warned, wounded me more in uh, more ways than one. But such things are to be expected, she said matter-of-factly. How could a woman help but love a man so striking as yourself? I know not, I said modest, modestly, but I think she must not, for she caught me with an easy smile and stole away without a word, like dew in the dawn's pale light, like a dream upon walking, Denna added with a smile, like a fairy maiden slipping through the trees, Denna was silent for a moment. She must have been wondrous indeed to catch you so entire, she said, looking at me with serious eyes. She was beyond compare. Oh, come now, her manner changed to jovial. We all know that when the lights are out, all women are the same height. She gave me a, a rough chuckle and ribbed me knowingly with a elbow. Not true, I said and with firm conviction. Well, she said slowly, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. She looked back at back up at me. Perhaps in time you can convince me. I looked in the deep brown of her eyes. That has ever been my hope. Dennis smiled and my heart stepped sideways in my chest. Maintain it, she said, her arm inside the curve of mine and fell into step beside me. For without hope, what do any of us have? They always they always do that with that that back and forth where they tell each other, mm-hmm. you know, half truths. Like, you know, mm-hmm. he's telling her that he's in love with her and that he's he, he his hope is to be with her. And you know, they're just dancing around the edges of it when she's sitting there, you know, maintain that hope. Don't give up. Yeah, it's funny when they do this, uh, when Denna gets the last word, it does put that emphasis on there that she's like, I, but I'm serious, though. I mean, we're fucking around here. And actually, I, <laughs> one of the parts that kind of it made me laugh because it just reminds me of when she's like, oh, when the lights are out, they're all the same height, mm-hmm. right? Like she's like one of yeah. the guys, like all of a sudden she's like, I love watching sports and playing video <laughs> yeah, games. Yeah. That's what I love yeah. to do. It's like, get the fuck out of here. Oh, you're just the perfect girl. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't know you existed. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, that that's that was uh that's a kind of a funny it's it's a great back and forth of which they always have where they almost like it's like they're ending they're finishing each other's thoughts and complimenting on the same thing. It's like they're, like they're writing a diatribe. It's like they're always writing plays with each other. They they just they, they are incapable of speaking honestly and upfront with each other. They gotta cloak everything in fucking jokes and 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 like pretend and over the top fucking courtship where they get to say the things they want to say, but like have the ability no, to like it. fall back on like oh I was just teasing, I was joking. Like no, don't take me seriously. Like, oh, uh, well, this is kind of like, like what I was, you know, what would be what funny was, is like me and you should like go out on a date and like, you know, then, you know, hook up and start having sex with each other and live with each other and get married and have babies. Like, I don't want any of that. <laughs> oh, no, of course not. I was just joking. Yeah, just, was t- joking. Total was joke. joke. And then like go home and <laughs> cry yourself to sleep. He's... <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of what I was talking about a moment ago, though, with with why Kavoth could possibly excel representing the mayor because he gets to do it without doing it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, he, so now, now he gets to ask her out without asking her out. Right. It's like when, you know, you send your friend over like, how old are you? Oh, he's just wondering my friend over there. He's wondering if you're, you know, whatever the shit people did when they were fucking 10. Did I bet you every one of his notes ended with, uh, do you like me? Yes or no. Yes or no. The no. every note to <laughs> Malewin. Ended with that. Like, do you like me? Yes or no? Do you like me more? Yes or no? Now, how, yeah, he's how so, much do you like me on a scale or. of one to ten? Nice. That, that's, a, that's a smarter move than the yes or no. I used to get the yes or no's, and I remember being that asshole that circled no. I did it. Or, I mean, not no, or. I circled mm-hmm. or. Because I didn't, you know, didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah, it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. <laughs> spared him great job fucking crushed it I mean, good job good work six sixth grade uh, i have a that is all i have a girlfriend have a at another them. school um, otherwise i'd totally there you go be into it i have this like, uh, what, have what's her name she's from the pen she's from niagara falls paper your girlfriend's name is pen paper are you just naming things you're looking at 
<laughs> literally yeah. say she's Niagara Falls. Yeah. Wait, I thought she. I thought she just went to another school. Yeah. No, she does. She's fr- her name is Niagara Falls. She's exotic. <laughs> so, yeah, it's weird because we're discussing Niagara Falls in class today. Yeah, it's it is. Uh, it's oh, ironic. Yeah, I was thinking about her. Yeah. But yeah, that's all I got on the on that chapter. Mm-hmm. All right, so chapter sixty-seven is titled "Telling Faces," and in this chapter, Kavoth learns all the proper etiquette from Stape, and then he has his dinner and meets Malewin, and after that, he goes and starts composing love letters to her, and basically lets Mayor Alvaron know that he's the um what's his face um too short he's the too short of this world as far as picking up ladies he's a he's a strong ladies man and if he can't get a girl in a month nobody can i do like uh how confident he's even surprised by his own confidence so I, yeah i got this bro i got it so i'm saying man you listen too short that is a very confident man in his ability to pick up women yeah well Kavoth is the, uh, I was going to say heir apparent, but uh, he's just, he's that version in this world, yeah. apparently. Yeah, and, and we don't know how tall he is, but too short's not really that short, so I guess the name could fit. But yeah, so I, I like the, you know, it starts with him learning etiquette from Stapes and just the, the, the stupid shit of people trying to show off their money is basically what the etiquette is. It's not like being a proper gentleman. It is demonstrating your wealth by how much fucking shit you can waste. And, you know, and and then there's also the, you know, the, the, the back and forth, the, the social power struggles and, you know, on how to be properly subservient and, you know, shit, shit along those lines. So it's like, it's never, uh, it was improper to eat the entirety of a piece of bread. Some portion should always be left on the plate, preferably be, preferably more than the crust. The same was true of milk. The final swallow should always remain in the glass. And then he's like, uh, commenting on the food wasn't rude, but it was rustic. The same was true of smelling the wine. And apparently the soft, the small soft cheese I'd been served uh, possessed a rind, a rind any civilized person would have recognized as inedible and meant to be pared away. I mean, barbarian that I am, I had eaten all of it. It had tasted quite nice, too. Still, I took note of this fact and resigned myself to throw away half of a perfectly good cheese if it was set in front of me, such as the price of civilization. I like that line that he's a barbarian and then the price of the civilization, considering you know where the story leads with the ADEM and how much that is their thing. Like you're a barbarian. And then all these things we're teaching you that you think are unnecessary. This is civilization. This is what it means to be right. civilized is living the way we live. And so he's, you know, it, it's, it's when you go back through it, you can kind of see how, you know, those two things kind of play off of each other. Yeah. I mean, and we get it with uh, the kissing of the back of the hand and how it's done differently in different cultures, those mm-hmm. cultural, cultural differences. Smelling of wine, that's retarded to me. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's a huge part of the taste is the smell of it. We have this extraordinarily expensive wine. Just pour it out, bro. Just pour it out on the floor. I don't so ever wealthy. smell my drinks. It's never, never something that I've, 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 but, I've I mean, had you drink, wine. If you drink... But I mean, even if you drink like good scotch, I don't that's smell a big part the scotch. You taste it. I do taste it. Yes, but, but like I'm not trying to taste. like fucking pour the scotch down my nose. Like I'm pouring, pouring it down my <laughs> throat. Saying. My tongue is what is important, and the taste buds. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, got it. Okay. I don't even like the smell of like you know whiskey and shit. It's got a very pungent smells great. fucking smell. It fucking. It kind of like burns your nostrils, like smelling it. It depends. Depends on what you're drinking, for one. But I think you can judge the the taste of it by smelling it. So, I'm all about smelling the wine. I can. I, I mean, whiskey, I'm gonna drink it if I got it. I'm gonna drink it no matter what. So I'm gonna taste it. I'm not trying to fucking get a pre taste with my nose. It just seems weird. 
pre-taste. But you're not civilized, bro. No, yeah. I, you're way, you're no, wasting. I am civilized. You're the one uncivilized well, you in the sense sticking your wasting. nose in your glass and like sniffing your drink. My like, glass. Like a fucking a dog like that can't get its tongue down into the no. bottom of the glass. No, no, no. This is what people do. But all, yeah, the, well, the part of the cheese is, is pretty hilarious to me because he's like, it actually tasted quite nice. Well, if it tastes good, sounds like it's edible. Sounds like it's okay to eat it, you know. But whatever, well, yeah, it's they part of their their whole thing. Throw away the bread, like I, you know, that yeah, is obviously edible table etiquette. Yeah, yeah, the table etiquette bullshit. It's just, yeah, it's I mean, it's not you, even it's not even table it. etiquette at that point. That is just purely showing that we we are wealthy enough. Where we can just yeah, waste yeah. food. That is all that is shown. It is yes. a demonstration of wealth. And then the, like, you know, uh, when he talks about, like, sending a plate back and that kind of thing, it, you know, if you put your napkin on the table too soon, it's a rebuke. And, like, that stuff's just, like, power struggle shit. Yeah, yeah. It's not being, none of this stuff is, like, being polite, not, you know, it's not like, you know, keep your... Keep your elbows off the table. Don't fucking burp in someone's face. You know, don't be making fart noises with your armpit. <laughs> well, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, restrain yourself from doing that. Yeah. That's oh. all I think about at Thanksgiving dinner. It's like, man, I want to make fart noises so bad. Yeah. But I can't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge problem. So it's, it's why I never go out. Because that's what you yeah. do constantly. Yeah. Because I just can't resist. I like to make fart noises you're, with my armpit. Anytime I'm around people, I cannot resist the urge to start making fart noises. You're you're literally like chafed under your fucking armpits from doing yeah, it so much. Yeah. There's no <laughs> and no hair under my right armpit because it's all been so pulled away ridiculous. from so much oh, so much usage. I do like picturing the person doing that and cracking themselves yeah, up as they yeah. do it. Like it's hilarious. <laughs> That's, if that's if fun. someone did it and they were like seriously at like a formal dinner and then they just kept doing yes, that'd it, be funny. like the that first time they did it, I would just be like this fucking dork and uh, like this <laughs> in- immature as shit. But if then they kept doing it and like they were pissing everybody off doing it and like people were getting more and more angry with the person because he just wouldn't stop. Like then I would start dying. I would lose it. I would be, I'd be crying. I'd be in tears. The more, and the more mad everybody got, the funnier I would think it would be. Yeah. So he's just doing it for you. Yeah. So I'd be a good audience for that. So if you're ever at a very formal (laughs) dinner with me and you want to fucking, you want to win the room with, for me, that's what all you got to do. It's not winning the room. It's literally just winning you over. Yeah. Well, I'm the the most important person in that room. Humble as always. Yep. Um, yeah. It sounds like uh Mellowin is uh pretty attractive. That's the the vibe we get. This is another thing that Rothfuss does uh I, I like that he does so well is you get the impression that she's extraordinarily attractive. I still don't know anything about what she looks like. You know, like and I don't even think it's a he's looking at her and he's he's stunned by how beautiful she is. I, it is that I think it's just she looks like his mom. Well, well, the reason why I say it the way I'm saying it, while I might have been prepared for the meal, I was not prepared for the sight of Mellowin Lackless herself. Luckily, my stage training took hold and I moved smoothly through the ritual motion of smiling and offering my arm. Blah, 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 blah. So I, I say it in the sense that that sounds like he's shocked by how attractive she is. And then, yes, it does become like, where have I seen her before? And he just what starts staring her? at her. There's yeah. something... Yeah, and there's something about her profile. He doesn't then again talk about like how attractive she is, but that gave me the impression that she's stunningly attractive. But then, yeah, I guess you're right. He is also like, well, how do I know this person? And shit, if she looks like her mom, it's in, it's interesting to uh, to sort of well, the way he insinuates it is subtle. We we get it from other pieces, but. That insinuation is it, it, it's interesting because he's seen her in so long, right? He doesn't see any of his family anymore. He, obviously, he's going to know what his mother looks like. But again, it's been I don't know how many years, yeah, right. But out of anybody's profile, he's probably going to know her profile more than more than anyone, right? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting um, dichotomy to bring into the 
into the the story. Yeah, I mean, she completely throws him off with that, and then like with his, you know, my eyes wandered over uh, Mattingly familiar her Mattingly familiar features. Might have met her at uh, the Eolian. Uh, that didn't seem likely. I would have remembered. She was strikingly lovely with a strong jaw and dark brown hair. I'm sure I'd seen her there. Do you see aught that interests you? She asked without turning to look at me. Her tone was pleasant, but accusation lay far under, far beneath the surface, not far beneath the surface. I had been staring hardly a minute at the table and I was already putting my elbow in the butter. I beg your pardon, but I am a keen observer of faces and you're struck me. So immediately saves it but i i and that, another thing about etiquette that doesn't make any sense like why wouldn't you want to stick your elbow in the butter like then like anytime you need bread you just poof, you got your elbow right there you can fucking just wipe the wipe the elbow over the top of the bread fucking shove now, it down your face you mention it, now that you mention it what a great what a great way to butter bread I mean, way more effective. You don't have to knife. put. You don't have to put you down your spoon. Like you're already th- just yeah. picture yourself like you're shoveling food into your mouth with your spoon, and then you just reach over with your other hand, rub the bread on the elbow, and then when you pull the spoon out of your mouth, you just immediately are ready to shove butter bread right into your you mouth. Know what, you know, what, this is this is pretty genius actually because it, you wear short sleeves every dinner, right? Yeah, short sleeves or tank top. You're not putting your elbows anywhere else. No. They're free and they're up. So you're not putting butter anywhere else. You're not you utilizing them at all. You're not throwing yeah. bows. You're right. You're right. Yeah. That's pretty genius. Yeah. You just literally stick it in. So that's how you start the meal. Stick it in the butter. And then now you have it ready. And you just you just slop it up. You, got, you, you can use it for you gravy know, too. Jam mm-hmm. on the other elbow or gravy. <laughs> you're just, you're, you're ready, you know, no matter what. Like if you need to... To butter up a piece of bread and on with one arm, and then with your other elbow, you can you know get the other piece of bread with some jelly, and you can be jellying and buttering two slices of bread at the same time. And they got, I mean, they have the finger bowls, right? So you just the finger bowls are for your elbows. Yeah, right? you just slap the elbow in there, and just you know, little little napkin, little little thing to brush it off. Yeah, I don't if see what the. I, I honestly, I don't. I think people are wasting the uses you could get out of your elbow. And it's just By waste, way, and it doesn't make any sense. Even the guy that's uh, doing fart noises with his armpit, still that elbow's not hitting me. No, yeah, just flopping up and down. He, but, he can, you know, you know, every time he like cranks <laughs> to like do a a fart noise, he can be wiping his other elbow and you know breading his butter at the same time he's making the <laughs> fart noises. The motions work perfectly if you just like. Picture yourself, like, do that if you're in your car, pull over, and then, like, stick one hand under your armpit, and the other pretend it's, like, holding bread, and, like, you're buttering your elbow as you're making fart noises. You could do that. Totally do that. Yeah, we're definitely underutilizing our appendages at the dinner table. And this is, I, I'm, this is already, it's going to be one of our best episodes. Like, the <laughs> amount of useful information that we have delivered and we just changed the, the entire game for eating. Like we should, no really one's ever going to eat the same ever this. again. We might want to just release this out of order <laughs> yeah. because Thanksgiving's coming up. <laughs> yeah. We got to get this out, out for Thanksgiving. <laughs> this is going to fucking change the fucking game. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, but so yeah, he's he gets all all caught up in her face, and then he kind of you know changes his shit, and he's like, she's like, "Are you a uh, Turagior? What is it? What do they say? Turagior? 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 Yeah, I don't know how they say it. French. Can't remember. Turagior. But yeah, they those people claim to be able to tell you your personality, your future from your face, eyes, and the shape of your head. Pure blooded vintage superstition. I dabble a bit, my lady. <laughs> I, love that. I do i do i do like though he, he shits on anything he that he doesn't believe he just completely shits on it oh yeah he, he's what he's he's totally what he <laughs> what he like sort of gets angry about of everybody else thinking the arcanum's bullshit or thinking you know sympathy is bullshit yeah it and comes up the same thing it back. comes up it's where funny. not too long from now where uh, i think it's the mayor says something and he completely dismisses it and he's 100 percent wrong yeah but yeah, so he's like, but I love that pure blood adventure superstition. I dabble a bit. 
<laughs> Fucking hilarious. Uh, but it's, the, it's a good reason for why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah. So it's more of that rough as deadpan humor too. And then, uh, really, what does my face tell you then? She looked up and away from me, made a show of looking over her feet, features, taking note of her pale skin and artfully curled chestnut hair. Her mouth was full and red without the benefit of any paint. The line of her neck was proud and graceful. I nodded. I can see a piece of your future in it, my lady. One of her eyebrows went up a bit. Do tell. You will be receiving an apology shortly. Forgive me. Or forgive my eyes. They flit like the Calanthus, place to place. I could not keep them from your fair flower face. So much in this book is with Kavoth as the uh, speaking in verse. Like for a guy that hates poetry, he conversates and, you know, he, his conversations are poetry. Yeah, this, this sentence especially. Yeah, they flit like the Calanthus, place to place. I could not keep them from your fair face flower face i also love how he throws in calanthus when he just learned that word yeah (laughs) (laughs) he's he's the guy with the uh learn a day calendar just got this word like two chapters ago and he's fitting it into conversation yeah he's 100 percent that guy you you know when he said this too by the way he said calanthus calanthus the loudest so everyone else could hear it you Mm. know what i mean calanthus you know (laughs) <laughs> you know, those birds, you probably call them flits, sip quicks, you know, but I call them Calanthus, the old name. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're right. He d- he does speak a lot in verse. And uh, I mean, again, this is a testament to uh, Rothfuss's ability. It's great the way he writes it. And, and I, I like, it's too, that he cool. when he's he notices, like, she smiled but did not blush, not immune to flattery, but no stranger to it either. And so he, like, starts, he's filing away her personality and what she likes, what yeah. she doesn't like. I mean, he's analyzing her big time in this, you know, this whole interaction. And then... Yeah, it's great. I, I, I love that how Rothfuss does that because he mentions it there and then later he's, like, enjoys boldness. And he keeps, he's noting these things, which... He's on, he's, he's clocked in. You yeah. Know what I mean, he's, he's on the job right now, which is, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And he's, she's like, you know, see anything else? Two other things, my lady, it tells me you are Melo and lackless and then, and that I am at your service. And then she holds out her hand he kisses it. And yeah, he talks about like, I press my lips briefly on, onto my own thumb that held her hand because, you know, actually kissing her hand would have been seen as entirely inappropriate and uh invent and versus the, the commonwealth world. yeah and yeah and so i like this uh viceroy of uh banis yeah. yeah oh and also uh before that when he's like you know he gets his soup and he's like why in god's name would anyone make a sweet soup 100 percent agree sweet soups gross sweet pizza gross i don't know like uh pineapple on on pizza don't know yeah, why people do it. It's gross. I it's my wife likes it. It's I don't like it at all. I don't like sweet. I mean, like if it's sweet, I've it's got to be like spicy sweet, like a jalapeno or something like that. I've I've had I've had a barbecue pizza that was good, but it's never something that I would prefer. If I hear pizza, yeah, I want like sausage and fucking yeah, I want salty and onions and cheese and sauce. Pepper. Yeah, yeah, but but also sweet soup. The only thing that comes to mind is like carrot. Which is not my favorite. Yeah, you know that sounds disgusting. Not a big soup person. I don't know. If I'm not I've really a eaten. big soup person to begin with. No, I'm not either. But carrot soup sounds super gross. Like, are you talking about like pureed carrot? Yeah, carrot soup. I mean, they make soup out of carrots. I've, I mean, I've had it before. Or like, you know, butternut squash. That's a soup. That's your thing. Butternut squash. Yeah, right. Butternut squash. I like butternut. That's not squash super sweet. Though. Potatoes. Butterscotch potatoes. <laughs> Well, that's definitely sweet. Nothing like potatoes covered with butterscotch. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I, I again, I can't, I can't remember the last time I even had soup. I didn't know that they made pureed carrot soup. And now I'm kind of grossed out about soup. Like, I don't think I'm going to be able to eat soup for a long time after hearing just hearing that. It sounds so gross. Oh, my gosh. You okay? Sounds disgusting. 
like oh, pureed wow. carrot. Like carrots are not that good. They're not a fucking quality vegetable. I eat carrots quite often, actually. I can handle like shaved carrot in a uh, salad, but I'm not gonna just like munch on a carrot. They're not I tasty. Literally today, munched on carrots. I eat them raw. Ugh. They are not good. I don't know what's wrong with you. You got something wrong with you. I don't think so, man. Oh, no, one hundred percent. You definitely have something carrots. wrong with you. I mean, maybe yeah, I'm sure everybody's got something wrong with them. I don't think what I have wrong with me is related to consuming carrots. No, that definitely is. You need to get that checked out. By the way, I mean, but think about it. Like one of the best rappers in the world, he stuck carrots in his baby girl's ear. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> And there like a uh, in there like about? a meme where like someone like shows like baby little tiny baby carrots like stuck in his <laughs> fucking little girl's ears. Fucking hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it's fun to take those things literal, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that's one of those funny ones where you take literally. It's better. Like Shalon should take notes on on memes. She would her jokes would be better. Yeah, on, uh, if she was changing it to memes, she already draws. So she could up her fucking uh, her joke game with memes. Yeah, why not? But you know, start the meme game. Yeah, but uh, um, you know, I I watched the uh, this viceroy of Bannis. I watched him put a finger into his soup without a hint of self consciousness. Taste it, then push the bowl aside. He rummaged in his pocket and opened his hands to show what he'd found. I always bring a pocket full of candy al- candy almonds to these things. He said in a conspiratorial whisper. His eyes as cunning as a child's. You never know what they'll try to feed you. He held out his hand. You can have one if you like. But I, I like this dude that, like, he, he yeah. just does not give a shit. Like, he's clearly, yeah. he's in a similar vein to Braden, as far as, like, Braden talks about, like, I'm not into the game. He's not into the game, but he's not into a beautiful game either. He's not into any yeah. of the games. Well, I, yeah, I love that he's very grandfatherly in the sense of, like, Number one, it reminds me of a grandfather that like gives you candy at the table. Yeah, but also he does not give a shit. He's no. like, dude, I'm old. I don't fucking care. I'm not eating this shit. Get the fuck out of my face. Like, and he's not doesn't have any qualms about, or doesn't seem to have any qualms about upsetting anybody about it because he doesn't give a shit at this point. No, no, he's he's firmly settled he's into his place, and like I think he's he, he's probably old enough where everybody else is just ah, what are you gonna do, man? It's just yeah, it's just fucking uh, viceroy. Immediately makes me like the guy. Yeah. For sure. Because everybody else is being all pretentious and shit, you know, and on their P's and Q's. And this guy's just like, yeah, I'm not playing this game. He's the one. He's the guy doing fart noises with under his arm. That's your guy right there. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. He he would think that was hilarious. <laughs> he always, he's as close yeah, as he He would can, be a good the audience for it. He's not going to he's not going <laughs> to make the fart noise, but he would be the guy that would be cracking up. He like, finally, something for uh, yeah. me. I see him, yeah, standing and applauding, yeah. throwing some almonds yeah. at him. Like, he's just throwing almonds. Like, here, catch it in your mouth while you make a fart noise. <laughs> Hitting his buttered elbows, trying to get it to stick. Now, that guy, yeah. That's a guy you could show him the buttered elbow, then he would appreciate the genius of it. He's definitely doing that the rest of the dinner. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so then we get... Uh, Mellowin's sitting next to a Yillish couple. There's a Yillish couple there chatting away in their own lilting language, combined with strategically placed decorations that made it difficult to see the guests on the other side of the table. Mellowin and I were alone, more more alone than if we had been walking together in the gardens. The merit arranged his seating well. And then we get through their conversation that she is not a big fan of the rip. She's she's a fan of boldness, not a fan of the real. Yeah, I like how it uh Rafis is so great with stuff like this where because it's gonna become a big, big issue, and he just gives us a little bit and then goes right back. You know, he, he gives us like there there I mean it just comes up in, in the discussion, uh, in terms about they they're talking about um uh, do you enjoy the theater occasionally, depending depending on the play, depending on the performers. And the way she says it, he's like, oh, what the fuck was that about? And then, you know, it kind of moves on. But you get a piece of it where it's like, I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't been watching her so closely. I decided to change the subject to stay for ground. But he notices this odd tension in her voice. It, it's great because we get it piecemeal. 
you know, and then eventually it's it's the biggest thing that sort of defines her in my mind is that she fucking hates the room. She's got extraordinary disdain. Yeah, like the the roads are always thick with Rue bandits this time of year, Mellowin said coldly. Not just bandits, Rue bandits. She said the word with such a weight of cold loathing in her voice that I was chilled to hear it. She hated the room. Not the simple distaste most people feel for us, but a true sharp hate with teeth in it. Damn. Yeah, she she's not a big uh, big fan, and she would not be into this conversation if she knew who he was. You know, though, her feelings... You know, I, I'd be curious what her feelings would be if she knew that her... That was she's his aunt. If she knew that, you know, her sister's kid was sitting next to her. I wonder if she would yeah. still hate him. She probably would. I, I think her hatred is it's, so it's deep. I, like, I don't think she could even, you know, accept the fact that he's family. It, it seems like it because it seems like it, it, the vibe we get because we don't we don't learn a lot about her outside of this sort of defining these defining moments of her and it it shows so much about her plus we know her sister's dead we don't know if she, she will pr- likely blame the fact that she went with him right she died with a whole troop if they even know that right if they even find that out we don't really have c- confirmation of any of that but clearly that's the big defining uh you know split in her mind so yeah I, it seems like even if she knew, but again, we don't really, we can't really, we don't, we don't see her in any soft ways, you know, of being like a, a nice person necessarily. She just, she doesn't get defined in those uh, contexts. No, like, I mean, he says, know. you know, he, he says, you know, that even the knowledge that she loathes the Rue could not entirely keep me from enjoying her company. Cause he, he talks about, you know, I found her to be everything Alvaron had suggested, intelligent, attractive, and well-spoken. So, she seems like, you know, a, 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 a cool person as far as in that echelon of society goes. And, but she, yeah, she's her hatred for the Rue. I, I don't think she could look past that. Even if she knew he was, you know, Kavoth was her nephew. I don't, I don't think she'd probably think of it. Like, it seems like she thinks that her sister was kidnapped, not just left with the Rue, like that they stole her. And then she would probably think of Kavoth as, you know, being her son through rape or something along those lines. Yeah, that wouldn't help. No, I don't. I don't think it would. Uh, I don't think that would even fix things. I don't. I don't. She and she might see him as a a threat to her power somehow. Because especially if she's yeah, the younger I mean, sister, like the you know she could see him as like a threat to her position as the head of the household, even though uh, his mom, uh, Lorian, bailed on the family. So it seems like she'd be out of the loop at that point when she bails, like seems like she forfeits any claim to the, you know, the household. Yeah, I would assume so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how it works. It does seem, I mean, the, the way we, the way we get her, uh, her perspectives delivered. It seems like yeah, she would take the assumption that I don't think she would have. I think she would have nothing but disdain, and which is what she ends up having anyway. Uh, for Kaboth, doesn't matter how much he shows worth in her eyes, leading up to the point that he reveals the truth about himself. It's just disdain from that point forward. And then, yeah, and then uh, he goes back to the room after this, and this is where. Goes into too short mode where he's already got three yeah. da- drafts of a letter, an outline of a song, and five sheets filled with notes and phrases I hope to use later. So he's already, he's like got half of Blowjob Betty that's already written. <laughs> yeah, he, he knows he's, fast, you know, that's one of the songs he's writing. I lo- just, just that, that short little uh, part you mentioned, it shows us immediately, like, this dude's ready for this and he's fucking good at it. And this is like, you know, he's, he's about to kill it, uh, at, uh, you know, courting. Yeah. And I mean, and I, I respect like the things he says, you know, they're, they're probably pretty accurate in most situations with the, you know, like, he's like, don't, don't you think this is a little much? 
And no, I paused my writing long enough to gesture with my pen toward a different piece of paper. That one is too much. The one in your hand is just enough. She's got a streak of romance in her. She wants to be swept swept from her feet, though she'd probably deny it. Um, and then he talks about like, you know, you want to get this, you want to get this letter to her quickly because you're right, you were right. She is a woman well worthy of pursuit. In a handful of days, there will be a dozen men in the estate who would gladly take her to wife. Am I right? There are already a dozen here, he said grimly. Soon there will be three dozen. At another dozen, she will meet at dinner or walking in the garden. Then another dozen who will court her merely for the chase. Or of those dozens, how many will write her letters and poems? They will they will send her flowers, trinkets, tokens of affection. Soon she will be receiving a deluge of attention. You have one best hope. I pointed to the letter. Act quickly. That letter will catch her imagination, her curiosity. In a day or two, when the other notes are cluttering her desk, she will already be waiting the second one of yours. Which I agree in, you know, in, in principle, but in in reality, too, it's like, yeah, dude, but I'm also I'm the second most yeah. powerful man on the fucking planet. Yeah. And she is close to that power. Like there's not if she wants to marry up. She's got very limited options. Yeah. So if he's healthy and, you know, can produce heirs and all that kind of shit, then, you know, now that he's not sick anymore, seems like he doesn't need to do, you know, like the the wooing is, you know, a, a side benefit at that point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the censure, right? Or it clenches the situation. But yeah, you're right. It's It kind of gets lost in this uh this circumstance or left behind that he is like one of the most powerful men in the entire world that's going to carry heavy in, in her mind it seems it, that, that seems logical to assume in this world to begin with and mm-hmm. also just given the fact that she's not like her sister and we know her sister wouldn't give a fuck at least from our experience or what we're assuming about her is she left by decision she didn't want to play this royal role the fact that Mellowin wants to, at least seeming, again, I'm just looking at it in relativity's sake, It you sort of make that assumption that that's what she'd be looking for, is someone powerful to adjoin with. And Yeah, well, it's, it's like, the, I, the I think it's probably example. similar to like his position, like hers is probably the same, where he's like, there's only one person I can marry. He's like, I don't want to like push her into it and get her to do it, you know, where she doesn't want to marry me. She doesn't want to be with me. I don't want to be with someone who doesn't want to be with me, but it's got to be her. And so yeah. he's just like, you know, he wants his fucking cake and wants to be able to eat it too. He like, he wants to marry her for her position, her political position, but then he also wants her to be into it. And then she's probably in a similar vein where she's got select few people that she would be willing to marry and, you know, she'd probably prefer to be in a in a relationship with someone she likes and who likes her. But I think without that power, you know, th- this isn't even on the table to begin with. She's not marrying yeah. Kavoth, like, you know, throw out the fact that Kavoth's her nephew. She's not marrying someone like Kavoth, even if she thought he no. was the fucking coolest dude on the planet. She's not marrying him. No, and again, I mean, that's we're taking a bit of an assumption just in the sense that we don't know that much about her. but. It seems like that's the case. The well, we know she's, she's going to the mayor's celebration and yeah. she's being wooed. She's seeing suitors yeah. and all that kind of shit. And so, and she does marry him. So it, it, it seems yeah, like, it you know, like, like, the, like the, she is playing, playing the game as well that, you know, she's not fucking just marrying, you know, anybody. Yeah, it seems like the the way it works is the you know <laughs> I've never been in the court, you know, a sort of atmosphere. But yeah, it seems like they play the field just by going to these events. They show you know their sophistication and you know it's it's this this whole alignment of the things that anybody wants in a relationship, but then also all those other things have to add up to it as well, leading into that. So there's this this uh, this pool of candidacy, and it's very it's I mean for for the mayor, it's one. And who knows how many it is legitimately for her. It does seem like it is bigger than they're making it sound like. But because it's the one, then he's looking at it as like, I got to do whatever I can to get this. But 
I, I like the line that he also comes out with with Alvaron, where he's like, "I know nothing of this. I wish there was some book of rules yeah. man could follow." Yeah. Which is really funny because it's like at some point in every guy's life or every you know person's life, as far as I I would imagine, we all at some point go through that where it's like, "Dude, what like?" Why, what's all the subtlety bullshit, this nuance and subtlety that you have to go through to, you know, get that relationship? It's like, isn't there just like a, an easier way to do this shit? But no, it's experience and time and. Well, and not only face. that, like, it's also it's just funny in the scope of this book, because Dan is always talking about everybody's got their fucking stupid rule books. Yeah. And she's like, I wish people would stop following the stupid rule book. And he's over here like, man, I wish there was a rule book. And then he's also fucking cut, you know, a handful of chapters later, sitting there talking about like, you know, I would buy you so many roses. Yeah, I'd it's all it's all roses, for roses you. on yeah. roses on roses. It's a it's a great moment because it's an inside joke that they yeah. both get to experience that we get to experience with them, which is yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, and then Kavos talking about like, you know, I don't know shit, but on the other hand, I had a vast wealth of secondary knowledge, like like you said. You know, t- 10,000 romantic songs, plays, and stories all together uh, had to be worth something. But, and then, you know, he talks about like he'd seen N- Simon fail and, um, you know, and, and he watched a bunch of men fail with Denna. So, like, he's, he, like I said, he's been watching YouTube videos on how to hunt. And so now he thinks he could, do- I could do that. I've watched so many but, videos on it. I could do it too. But actually, what he's watching is people not, being successful at hunting yeah that's his experience i've seen a bunch of people <laughs> fail and then i saw reenactments a bunch of reenactments of successful hunts yeah, <laughs> yeah i don't know man so like, whatever i guess it works for you but yeah it, uh, it doesn't uh if i'm the mayor i'm not feeling real confident sending you out there for me i'm so, i certainly oh, if was... i was the mayor i would have had a lot more questions yeah yeah like yeah. How many, it, or, or how many times are you action. like one? Are you, are you a virgin? And like at that point, <laughs> then like when he answers, if he says yes, I'm going to be like next. <laughs> or, or perhaps go to a, a bar and pick up a couple women. Cause Let's like see what you got. once he like hears him like play music and he's like, all right, you can be the musician. I'll let you write songs. But if you're like that level of a rocker, like you're, fucking a rock star and you're still a virgin you're not picking up the ladies yeah. for me <laughs> yeah so that's a yeah it's a funny way to look at it but yeah yeah it's uh things aren't adding up there but yeah Kavoth, oh, wait, I mean, Kavoth, shit, man, he's like 15 right Kavoth, just super confident with the uh will a month be enough time do you think when I spoke, I was surprised by the confidence in my own voice. Your grace, if I cannot help you catch her in the spa- space of a month, then it cannot be done. Boom. Love is cockiness, even though I, I think his cockiness in this situation is a little ridiculous. I s- still love it. I, I much prefer people who are absurdly confident when they shouldn't be than people who are, you know, not confident at all. I guess yeah, if you're I, I like air, that. air on confidence. Yeah, I like this uh, this version of uh, when Kavoth comes with the confidence like this, even though, yeah, he doesn't have a lot to base it on. But he saw her, he came back, he's starting to write a bunch of stuff, he feels like he's got a plan, he's he's being assertive with it, and uh, yeah, he's pushing. So, more power to him, I guess, you know, run with that. Yeah, and so on this next chapter, it's titled uh, The Cost of a Loaf. And he goes back with Denna and he sees her going through, running through dudes. He's going out with her running through, running through dudes. And then eventually she ends up leaving. And so he goes back to his room, can't write anything. And then makes up, comes up with the excuse on for the mayor to give him some extra time. And so he decide, you know, tells him that he needs to make a gram for him to protect him against magic. And so starts making, making a gram for him to get by. Yeah, it was a pretty good, uh, you know, switch off. I don't know what you describe it as. So sort of subterfuge to, uh, to get his mind off it and give himself time. Although he doesn't successfully make himself a, uh, a gram, which would have been really useful. 
started to, but yeah, he d- yeah. he didn't end up, and it ends up not really mattering much, but yeah. But yeah, then uh, I, I like the I like the fact that you know he talks about how he would go and hang out with Dinah all day, and then he would go home. And he's like, I flattered her outrageously and without hope because only a fool would hope to catch her. Then I would return to my rooms and and pen the letter that I'd been building inside me all day where I would pour out a torrent of song to her. And in the letter or song, I said all the things I dared to tell Denna during the day, things I knew, things I knew would only frighten her away. And then he would, you know, soften it up and make it for, you know, for mellowing. But I like that. Um, I like that aspect too, because you know, if someone read his poem or his song to Denna, and they're like, "Dude, that's a Denna." Like, no, it's not. I don't even like her. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah it's dude, uh, liar. It's pretty great. It's pretty great that uh, I mean, it's literally he's utilizing his feelings for her to be used in some other way. Which in a, in a way almost cheapens what he's doing, but yeah, if if she was reading them, she'd be like, she'd be, I would imagine swoon, uh, or swoon, would she be swozen? You know, uh, like his, they've uh, they've played here? so much of the the flirty game with each other that I think if she read something like that from him, she would laugh. She would think he was joking or fucking with her. I don't think she would take he's it seriously. Dug, he, I think he's, I he's, he's blown dug at, himself you know, pretty, the over the top romance type shit is not going to yeah. work with Denna at this point. Cause they, they, they are over already over the top romantic with each other. They say all these things, but you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's funny that you mentioned that because yeah, they have basically reached that point where it's like, even if she read it from him, then it's like, Oh, you're just playing this role again. Yeah. Here you are Prince Gallant yeah. again, playing that role when, yeah, it's really funny. Like he, he's boxed himself into a corner where his only only option now would be to just be honest with her. He'd dude, have to he, open dude, up. He, get, he gets he gets great opportunity um, within these chapters as well. Yet doesn't do it because he doesn't have the fucking courage or the, the ability to allow himself to expose himself in that way. I do like also how we do get description here as he watches. Who, who's the guy here, Jared? Jared, um, I I can't. Uh, yeah, Jared. Yeah, some some dude that she's with, but watching him make the same mistakes he's seen other others make, and it's just like the visual images of like some sad desperation of a guy struggling to possess a woman that's not interested in you. Yeah, and, and um, another thing of note too there is that he called her Alora. So this, I think that's the first time we've seen her not have a name that started with a D. Or that was close to yeah, yeah like Denna. But yeah, you're right. It's just Alora. completely different. Which um, I don't know if there's anything to that. I don't know what the if that means anything. But I'm curious because I I mean it seems like every other name starts with a D. I can't think of something. You know, maybe there's another example I'm just forgetting about. But as far as no, off the top of my head, it, it stands that that name stands out. And so I, I want, I'm yeah. curious, like if that's a name from her past or something along those lines. Yeah, that's interesting. That definitely does stand out. But yeah, that that part that uh, that I was talking about. Anytime you like, you talk to a friend who's like in a relationship that you know is fucking over, but they're just not willing to admit it. it it's just fucking sad as shit. Where it's just like they, they won't even listen to to reason, you know. Mm-hmm. And he's even he's at the point here where he's just like. Well, even well, yeah, it's it's almost like what ends up happening is the person's just trying too hard, and they're just not even seeing through their own blindness, you know. Yeah, yeah, and Jared, with you know, he goes into full white knuckle desperation mode, trying to cling on to Denna, trying to, I'll buy you anything you want. Fucking, let's go out Monday. Oh, I'm busy Monday. All right, Tuesday. Oh, I'm busy Tuesday. All right, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, next week, anytime. I'm open any time, every single day of the week. I have a hundred percent availability for you. And it's like, dude, 
you sound very, very, yeah, this very is, weak and desperate right now. Yeah. Like who wants it's, to be with someone who is a hundred percent available at all times, got nothing else going on. Yeah, it's it's like the saddest thing. Plus, once you do that, there's no going back. No. You can't then be like, Oh yeah, yeah, no, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm fine. Oh, you're Whatever. busy all those days? Well, I I was busy too. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was playing around. I don't really care. Whatever. It's like, oh, okay. Well, then I am available Tuesday. Oh, so am I. So am I. I'm available. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's super sad. Super sad. Depressing. Fucking. uh, When you see someone do that kind of stuff, where it's like, ah, dude, pull back. Fucking bail out. Yeah, it's, dude. I'm telling. Yeah, I'm literally thinking at times where it's like. Just stop, man. You got to. I understand where you're at. You're not helping yourself. You're making this much worse for yourself. Just whatever you can, just teach or tell yourself, stop. Just move on for a while, a couple days, whatever, man. Just chill out. But, uh, but yeah, so he, he's, you know, he sees a bunch of people fail and, and that, you know, influences him. He sees like all these guys clutching at her and shit, but he doesn't learn. He thinks he learned something from that. I don't think he does, other than not to do that. He learns only that, but he doesn't learn yeah. what she wants. He's only seeing, well, she doesn't want that, but he's not ever thinking about what does she want? What is, what the fuck does Dana want? What is it she's after? He never asked that question. That would be the only question I would be asking. Wouldn't be yeah. just like, okay, well, she doesn't want that. Okay, so move on from that. Let's stop fucking thinking about that. That's all he thinks about. It, all he thinks about is he she doesn't want that. It. And, and yeah, he, he just, just focuses his entire fear. He's never thinking like, what does she want? What is she after? She's clearly got a fucking agenda. She's not focused on getting in a relationship and starting a fucking family and being a housewife. That's clearly not her thing. What is her thing? Do you not have any curiosity for that? You, you're, the, you're the kind of guy like you will follow her to find out who her fucking patron is. You're super curious about who her patron is. You're not curious about fucking Denna? Like, and what the fuck is up with her? Like, it blows my mind. Like, why do you, why are you not asking these questions? Because that's all the questions I'm always thinking of. It's like, what the fuck is up? What what is she doing? Why? Yeah, it's it's funny because he just basically looks at all these guys as like, well, I can't be that. And that's all he focuses on is I don't want to be that. But he's not also focusing on, okay, then what's different than that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's it's like he just won't go far. He won't put his arm around her because they put their arm around her, and then she doesn't want it. It's like they're not you, bro. They haven't done everything you've done to this point. They're not in the position that you're in. He just can't. He can't. He just even sees still, like even if even if even if you're like okay, well, if I do that, I'm going to fail too. But it's like okay, but why would it fail? Why does she not want that? What is it about her? That she does not want that fucking savior, that safety blanket. She's not looking for it. Why is she not interested in it? Why? Ask those questions, and then maybe you can move forward with something. You're a smart fucking yeah. dude. You're one of the smartest or, dudes on the fucking planet. You should be asking some more questions and trying to figure that fucking puzzle out. I was going to say, and even if you're not going to ask that question, you can dance around that question you know, and get to it. Right. And like you said, he's smart, he's clever, and it's not, you don't have to ask direct questions. You can ask questions that are related to the, lead you to the answer that you're eventually trying to get to. Or, you know, you you could fucking be open up and be honest about yourself and tell her what your deal is, why you have secrets. You know, this is the person you clearly, you care about her more than anybody else. Open up to her, fucking tell her what, you know, why you are the way you are. She clearly has secrets. If you want her to be able to tell her secrets, then fucking open up. I mean, obviously he talks about he can't. He just can't open up. But he doesn't even think like, that's what I need to do. Like if if, that, I would have less frustration with Kavoth and and how he, he deals with Dennett if he was like, I need to open up to her. I need to explain why I am the way I am. I need to explain these things to her so... She understands me, and then maybe she'll feel comfortable opening up, and we can figure each other out, figure out what's going on. But he never thinks that. And if he thought that, and he was just like, but I can't do it. 
I, you know, I just can't do it. I know that's what I need to do, but I can't do it. Then I'd be like, okay, well, you know, fucking sometimes people fucking bury some shit down and they can't open up, you know, that's more understandable. But as smart as he is, he doesn't even think, consider that as an option. Like he he doesn't consider like this would be a good thing if he could do it, but he can't do it. One of what seems so, so interesting, they're both doing that. Yeah. They're both, you know, they're both in that position, which is what makes it so interesting to read and brings so much tension between them, which is frustrating. But they're both in that in that place, which is why they fucking do this dance and play that role and just, you know, say things that they mean some of what they say. Maybe they mean all of what they say, but they they say it in a way that they they're not assigned to the truth of the matter. Right. It's uh, no, yeah, no, it'd be it's, hilarious it's as crazy. if Kaboth opened up to her and then she like comforted him. But then, and he was like, and so now that I've opened up to you, like, is there any like kind of secrets you want to talk about anything you want to get off your chest? And she's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I like, mean, that's not the way it, fucker. It, it's it certainly does not seem like that's the way it would go, but uh, yeah, that'd be pretty funny yeah. if it, if it did. No, but, I'm good. Um, Everything's good. Nothing to complain about. It's rainy yesterday. I didn't like that. But no. If I were him, I would be tempted to uh to be using that dinner resin to open her back up. Yeah. Yeah. And then doing it yourself and then be like, all right, maybe this is what we need. Maybe now we can, you know, loosen it up a little bit. He look like have she, a few drinks or something. Shit. He fights her over and he's just got lines fucking laid out <laughs> like all right let's fucking do this tonight we're gonna get weird do you remember how fun that resin was right you remember that yeah. he's got hockey pucks they're taking yeah. chomps out of yeah <laughs> oh but yeah they then... actually what's really funny is not now that i picture it, it's like they did all the 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 uh the mathematical equations and everything trying to figure how much to give to uh, the Dracus, they just do it in reverse for them. Yeah. All right. So how much? And then they're just they're just sitting there at the table, like rolling little balls, then smaller, then making chops off of that. You yeah. Know, just gum it up. Yeah. And then you know, then it would be like, so like I've calculated it, and we'll be fine as long as we only each do two lines. She's like, dude, you've already done seven. <laughs> it's like I know. I don't think that's right. I don't think I've done any yet. No, trust me, you're tripping balls right now. <laughs> but yeah, and then so she ends up uh, dipping out. So he's like, you know, um, the second bird was worse after I'd been helping the mayor court his lady for almost two spans. So he had two span, 22 days of fucking hanging out with Denna, which is, you know, this is like their culmination of like, man, they, they go up to up to the height and get as close as they can get without it fucking you know going over the edge but yeah they get they they get a long long opportunity to fucking open up to each other and they they don't but yeah then so no trace or word of warning no note of farewell or apology i waited three hours at the livery where we'd agreed to meet after that i went to her inn only to find she had left with all her things the night before and so he sent you know he's he spends the next few days sulking and, you know, tries to play some music, can't do it, eventually gives up on that. And then he has to come up with an excuse on, you know, uh, why he can't write this song that the mayor's harping on him about. And so he needed to, he knew he needed to come up with something halfway legitimate. And that's when he comes up with the, you know, uh, you know, like the mayor comes in, it's like, I got your message. He said brusquely, have you finished the song then? No, your grace, something more important than the song has come to my attention. As far as you're concerned, there is nothing more important than the song, the mayor said firmly, tugging the cuff of his shirt to straighten it. I've heard from several people that Malewin was greatly pleased with the first two. You should focus your whole efforts in that direction. Your grace, I am well aware that out with it, Alvaron said impatiently, glaring at the face of the, the tall gear clock that stood in the corner of the room. I have an appointment to keep. Your life is in further danger from Claudicus. I'll give this to the mayor. He could have made his uh, living on the stage. The only break in his composure was a brief hesitation as he tugged his other cuff into place. 
And how was that? He asked, apparently unconcerned. But I like that aspect of the mayor. It's like, I can picture that, you know, like a guy with yeah. like a tuxedo playing with his like cufflinks and shit. And then, you know, getting his cuff exactly right. And then someone like tells him something, just like a brief pause as he's doing it. And then just like going back into methodically, just messing with his cuffs. I can picture someone doing that. Yeah, it's he seems written, like he'd be a, written uh, really well. Good. Yes, the way he writes it, it seems like he'd be a good poker player. Yeah, he's good at not showing his uh, showing his emotions. Yeah, and, or showing the emotions he intends to show. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and just the way it's written, it it puts a good visual in your head. It's it's written yeah well where you can visualize exactly what he's trying to get across. But yeah, and then so he kind of tells him, you know, that Quadicus could hurt him from a distance, and he's like. Um, he means to conjure up a Cindy and send it to bedevil me. Uh, he probably, I love Kavoth like, he's like fucking idiots. And he's like, yeah, he, he probably <laughs> believed in fairies in the walking dead. Poor fool. Both exist. Both fairies and the walking dead exist. <laughs> yeah. It's, again. Yeah. That's a really funny thing. The way Rothfuss does it because it does make, again, what we we're talking about before, it makes Kavoth look like the fool that he makes them all out to be. Yeah. He's very close-minded to what they're close-minded, you know. Florian exists in um, King Phasia. Uh He's a uh, Draugr. He's basically a walking dead. Like, so, yeah, both exist. But, yeah, he's like, well, these fucking simpletons, they probably believe in things that exist, exist. Yep, because they do. <laughs> You're hey, the especially the dude, the, the dude walking around like, oh, the Chandrian's real, not telling anybody, but in the back of his mind, Chandrian's re- Chandrian. Yeah, that, that's real. I know they're real and no one else has the balls to say it. That, that's the thing that's like, you know, you've listened, you've accepted Scarpy's story that there's, you know, these Amir figures like Selatos and Telu's real, Selatos real, Aleph's real, the Chandrian are real. I've heard about the angels, the Amir and and the, the Chandrian. You've obviously, you've seen the Chandrian up close and personal. They wiped out your family. You've seen their signs a second time. And you've seen the 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 vase of the the drawing, you know, the third of a drawing of that vase and stuff. So you've seen plenty of evidence of them. And then you're just completely dismissive of any of the other things. Like, yeah, okay, all of those things are real, but the things I'm not familiar with, those are not real at all. No way. <laughs> it does fit and and to a degree his personality. Yeah, yes, hundred percent. His dad was like that. Yeah, he's very, very much like if I haven't seen it, I don't believe it. You have to show me, or I'm not going to believe it, and I'm going to be kind of a dick about it. Yeah, you would, you would think that he would be more open to the idea. Not that he would believe it, but he would just think that he would leave open the door. Benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah. like maybe yeah, you know, yeah. I don't believe it, but it's possible. I've been wrong in the past. Like, no, he doesn't think that at all. He's like fucking idiots. He's fucking dumb people, morons <laughs> with their fairies. Yeah, Flurian exists. Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, fine. That is, that is, I'll go I'll go hang out with Florian and we'll have lots of sex. Sure, buddy. That that is one of the things within within I, I like that he weaves that in here because that's one of the things in our world that's really funny is that people become very arrogant of what, what they think they know. Yeah. Even though they don't fucking know. And there's all this history before us leading up to this point and all these stories that have been created for a reason. A lot of them are mythological. A lot of them are theological, philosophical, but they stand for reason. They're parables. They they teach. They're teaching tools. So th- the idea of just seeing all that, and because you're alive now, and we have iPads, right, and we have the technology we have, you're on this high horse of like, yeah, they're all savage retards with yeah. all, with with everything they thought before. You're just Mister Sophisticate up here with uh with your own ideas, which you've never even read. Well, again. I'm kind of just straw manning this, but you know where I'm coming from, where it's basically that that exists very much, very much in our world where people are just blinded to other other ideas because it makes the world easier. It's easier to accept, you know, what you know is true and forget everything else because hey, you don't have time for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He's a hundred percent that the, way. The, the, the philosophical bandwidth to, uh, to try to try to figure all these other things out. But, and I, I like the way he, demonstrates to the mayor that uh, you know what Cauticus could do to him like he has gives him an apple and then 
takes it back from him, sees a thumbprint on it, and then does a binding between the, the apple and his finger and pokes a uh, little needle through the apple to poke his finger and prick the skin a little bit, which is a cool demonstration. Like if someone did yeah. that to me, like my, I, I would be tempted to like, you know, fight them immediately because it'd be like, I'm killing this person because if they can do that, they need to be wiped off this earth. Yeah. They could, they could murder you in a second. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about like it. If this dude can fucking just start chopping me up with, if he gets my fucking fingerprint, he can just start stabbing me in my fucking thumb. Like this person needs to be gone. <laughs> like this guy is too big of a threat. If I, if, yeah. if you're the mayor and you're in that position of power, like that, that's a risk. Both showing him that he has that capability because the mayor could have took that a totally different way. Well, I was going to say later he gets, uh, you know, the, the mayor Alvaron cocktail that he gets to, he, he gives him as yeah. a whole essence, if you want to call it that. But a, again, huge risk, right? Cause now he could freaking boil him alive. You know, he could, I mean, he, do whatever. He's a, he's but, a superstitious guy too. And like, so, yeah. A, yeah, I mean, a he's earned earned a bit of his both trust, both. but still, that's a big risk, and Kvothe doesn't even see it as a risk. And but yeah, no, it's a it's a big risk. Like if he could easily have taken that a different way and took it as a threat, and like anybody, he could have went in the direction of anybody with this power needs to be eliminated. Yeah. But he does end up. So he he shows him what what could be done, and then he tells him about the gram, and you know that he can make one for him. And I like the aspect of like, you know, the mayor asked him, was like, all right, and what's this going to cost me? And Kvothe run through, he's like, dude, I could get, uh, and Ian Tresser loot and, you know, all this shit. And like the mayor could get me basically anything I want with no problem. The only thing he's like, well, I'm, might need you to be, you know, a patron for dinner. Something she clearly doesn't want. It- I was gonna say it's so it's so funny to read that because we know she she wouldn't approve of this at all. No, not only that she she gets upset. Yeah, <laughs> when he brings this up, like, dude, no, what are you? It's like, I need this, doing, dude. Man? This other guy's teaching me magic. It's not just that. I mean, it is that. It's but that. It is also yeah, like, like I, if he I, wasn't I, f- no. helping her with shit, then she would, you know, like she probably would be more open to it. But she also doesn't want. Someone to take care of her. She doesn't want to feel beholden. Yeah, that's what to I was someone. gonna say. Yeah, I was. I was gonna say that, that. That's another part of it as well. Is like she has to get shit on her own. It's. It seems like she has a severe, like deep, deep down trust issue in the sense that she has to do it on her own and can't be taken care of. It's like she doesn't trust someone to take care of her even to that point. It's an interesting. It, it's an interesting difference of broken that she has as compared to what Kaboth has. It's a, it's a weird version because when you think about the the patron is basically doing that for you. It's like, yeah, but I don't want but it's you to find the person who's going to be the yeah, person that yeah, helps exactly. me. It's like, dude, what? Okay, that's a weird <laughs> fucking loophole that you it have. Is. But I think that, that speaks to the hang-ups. Yeah. Right? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, because it's yeah, it's it gets compartmentalized differently. It's just like Kavoth more confident that he can win Meloin, which he thinks he has Denna and probably thinks he can never win Denna, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's compartmentalized. He gets to compartmentalize it in a certain way. It's their hangups, man. Their hangups are real, like, skeleton in the closet type shit. <laughs> that, Tattooed on their soul. Then the other one with uh, Alvaron going... Ah, damn. Like, well, I guess I'll have to find someone else to write a song for me. I was like, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up, hold up. Like, let's not go too far. So, like, you, you know, the absence makes the absence makes the heart grow fonder. Basically what he tells him. It's like, you know, get, we can, we can afford to give her a few days, a few days wait. And like, he, he, he explains it, you know, perfectly with the, like, you know, who, who yeah. do you like? The girl that's like falling all over you? The girl that's playing a little hard to get. It's like, yeah, it's the same thing with women. It's the same thing with everybody. You know, if someone's desperate and it's like we watch with that guy that's like, you know, let's go out fucking any day of the month, any day, any pick yeah. a day. I'm available every single day. Like someone that available to you, it just like they you don't want to be with that person because it's like, well, they, they clearly don't have any other options. 
th- this is great on Roth's part because we all know this. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, I, if you're younger and reading this, maybe you don't know it, but it's a hundred percent true. I mean, it's it, that person that's so into you, like ridiculously into you. It's not going to work because you're just not going to have that level of respect. It's, it's, it's a really strange thing that's embedded within us in a way. Maybe it's not strange at all, but in, in many ways it is strange because that person that wants you more than you even want them, they, they will probably treat you real well, but you can walk all over them. Yeah. That's going to be a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a big problem for that relationship down the road. And you don't learn that. That's something you do learn through experience. And as you get older, but even it's, it's even ingrained in you with you, if you go out and that person's all over you, it's like, you're looking elsewhere because you didn't have to try for this. Yeah. When you have to make that effort, it means that much more. And that's always the case I mean, with everything really. But yeah, that's, that's a great, uh, great inclusion here. And, but it is funny the way you brought that up. I think what, where you're going with that is he does a great job of explaining to the mayor, but it's real convenient because the mayor's like, well, I guess I need someone else to do. Well, this was intended. It's yeah. like, well, you said you need to make a gram. That has nothing to do with this shit. Yeah. It was just convenient that it's both. And I guess yeah, in a way it is. But yeah, he convinces him with that and then, you know, tells him he's going to need his, uh, his substance. And what was, uh, where's, where does he say blood, more precisely saliva. some of your substance speak plainly, a small blood of your blood, sal- uh, saliva, skin, hair, and urine. Urine mentioned, um, yeah. and it's going to be mentioned oh. again. Oh. So urine he it's it's not a hundred percent solidified what urine is urine we don't have a definition so we don't know if urine is the same thing in our in their world as it is in ours so it does not prove (laughs) that there are bathroom breaks and we don't know how their their system functions maybe it's the same thing it's urine but they sweat it out and they don't take pisses they don't have to use the restroom so there, it's not solidified that they have to take restroom breaks yet. But that is the fact they they bring up urine here and then they bring it up again later when he drinks a bunch of coffee. That stands out. That's huge. I like the uh, I like the idea of thinking that in this world, this is normal. Like a, a cologne of the mare. Yeah. A you de toilet of the mare, one's essence. Yeah. And then, then also like, yeah, and you know, why don't you just top it off with a little semen for you know the the big fan, yeah. the big fan of yours, <laughs> you know, the day ones. <laughs> just bottle it up and pass it around the town, and, <laughs> and you know, and like you you got to do it in front of an audience. I don't know why the spell just doesn't work unless you do it in front of people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's going to be uncomfortable, but yeah, in front of everybody in the whole town, everybody in the town has to see you do this. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's an interesting concoction of things. Uh, You know, it's it's kind of funny, too. Like, he doesn't really need to make this for the mayor, you know, like it would. It's 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 actually smart because Kodakis could fuck him up. Yeah. True. True. Um, I'm so yeah, I'm actually I mean, surprised well, that like Cauticus never like took you know some blood or shit from the mayor and never you know did something a little more direct. Than like just you know had there. it in his back pocket to use in case. Well, if you're poisoning the mayor, you would, would just think you would have had like some fucking fallback options. Well, and the fact that he's poisoning him to not kill him does really bring up a lot of questions of like so what were the really the intentions here he didn't want to create he, was, he came he very close to killing him power. at the end though it seemed like he was he was pushing him over the edge there at the end because the mayor almost died i mean he barely survived you know survived the shit yeah but didn't he barely survive weaning off of it yeah but if you're already at that point and you can barely survive weaning off of it then there, well, that, there's you, but, you know, and, and you see him. He's like bedridden at the end. Like he can't fucking get up yeah. out of bed. Like he was on his way out. But I mean, so that, but that's also the interesting thing about. So what? 
was he trying to do? Seemed he like was he was trying to, trying to kill him there, and just. But so, but but he wasn't completely trying to take him out. He just started to try to kill him once Kvothe showed up. No, it's it seemed like you know Kvothe showed up at the end of the you know the like Claudicus was playing a long game where he's gonna he was trying to kill the mayor and it, or at least put him out of commission. And then eventually he decided so to a kill him. Careful one, and then. You know, Kavoth just showed up at the end of it because, yeah, you know, with, with what he's doing, it's eventually going to kill him. I mean, it's yeah. it's not like you can just do this forever. What he's doing is going to kill him. Like the the in, you know, the it, the only way to like stopping almost killed him. It, it got to that point, so it seems like Cauticus was clearly trying to kill him. At the end, he just what? was trying to do it in a in a slow way where no one would think you know suspect him of it. What if uh, he really played this super slow game, and instead of doing the poisoning, he would just feed him cigarettes? I mean, that would be a different way. I don't... <laughs> Probably, if, if you're trying to keep him from uh, pumping out babies, it's not going to be very effective. Rothfuss just becomes, he just has this agenda against tobacco. Like, he, yeah. he just <laughs> throws that in there, like, this is what's going to get him. The only people that die in the world are smokers. He's laid on really <laughs> thick. Everybody else is super healthy. All the smokers, their teeth are all falling out. Their eyes are fucking yeah, black and fucking, yeah. Skin's all crinkled. Yeah. yeah. It's like over the top message why, of why don't it, smoke. Yeah, it'd be like, why is it so, why is it so potent in their world? Yeah. <laughs> like, why is it so, what, they don't have like, a, it's just a different type of tobacco? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, she dinner used to be so hot, and then she smoked a cigarette. She won. Yeah, yeah it took... <laughs> this huge anti anti cigarette campaign just loaded into the book. That'd be weird. Yeah, be weird yeah, it would out. definitely. It would have been a weird book. I I don't think it would have sold as well. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for me on sixty eight. Yeah, me too. All right, so chapter 69 is titled Such Madness. In this chapter, Gavoth goes about making the gram for the mayor, and then Denna comes back in town. They end up spending the day together, and once he comes, once she comes back, he's able to write again. Writer block is over. Yeah, I think she might have something to do with it. Seems like she's the muse, as if we didn't already know. Um, I did, uh, well, for me, uh, the beginning of this chapter did kind of make me realize why I thought a long time ago uh, in book one, when he ended up embezzling. He tried to, the, yeah. He tried to yeah. like uh, l- borrow gold and, you know, That's gold and it, silver and shit like that. Yeah. In the back, in the back of my mind, I was like, I, I wondered if he was, if he was considering making a gram because shortly after he started to try to make a gram, but you know, he ended up doing exactly what he wasn't supposed to do, which he used it to then get money for the crossbow, I think. No, like he did he wasn't able to get it. The guy told him no. And then eventually, yeah, then he gets permission to to borrow those things later on. And yeah. that's when he uses it to yeah, to buy the uh crossbow. Yeah, it's just when I saw it, it it made me think of that because I'm like, I wasn't sure where in my mind I got this idea that the gram needed gold or something like that. But yeah, I guess it was here. Yeah. Well, he does so, like, I mean, it, cause when Kelvin, when he shows him the arrow catch, he goes like, um, what, uh, you know, it's, it looks like you borrowed gold and all this. And he's like, I can't see where that's needed in your schema. And he, uh, in his head, he's like, I couldn't tell him I needed it for, you know, the, the gram. And, you know, and so he tells him I used it to buy the, the crossbow, but he doesn't also tell him, you know, I also used it for the gram. Yeah. So it basically becomes, I used it to then exchange it for cash to then be able to buy the thing that I'm not supposed to have. Yeah. Which he did, Which but he trouble. also used yeah. some for, for, you know, the gram. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so he goes down, he makes the, makes stuff, tries to find dinner, can't. And then the, um, He's like, you know, he he started to get addicted to it. Like, you know, she is his dinner. Like, he didn't realize how yeah, much it came to yeah. depend on it. 
And so, yeah, he was going through withdrawals. It's funny that he says, uh, quite by coincidence, in the course of this buying and selling, I visited many of the places Dinah and I had spent time together. It's almost like he convinces himself in in situations. Because, we've, I mean, we've seen that in other situations where he's like, you know, I wasn't really looking for, but then I went to this place, this place, this place, this place, and then these places again. But, you know, (laughs) like he's even like lying to himself that like, you know, but I, I mean, I don't really like her, like her. I'm just, you know, whatever. If she's there, cool. I don't know. That's kind of how it read to me, which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. And yeah. That might not even be the intention, but you know, whatever. But yeah, then, you know, he's, he's like, he goes to see some little puppet show or something. And, you know, 10 hours I spent there. And the only act of creation I accomplished was to magically transform nearly a gallon of coffee into marvelly, marvelous aromatic piss. See, that's what makes me think that it's not actually urine, like in our sense of the word, because I do not think (laughs) of my piss as being marvelous, aromatic piss. I think what he's saying, though, is it becomes in a uh, marvelous way, more aromatic. Especially like coffee. If you're just drinking a shit ton of coffee, like I don't see why that would like come out smelling really good. Well, I don't think he's insinuating good necessarily. Marvelous is ve- is a very well, positive yeah, I guess. descriptor. He should have put in asparagus. He should have been eating tons of asparagus. Pungent. If he said pungent, just, I'd be like, yeah, he. they definitely take bathroom breaks. If he said pungent. But the fact that he said marvelous really throws you off. And I think that's intentional. Rothfuss writes things in a very intentional way. And I think he wanted to throw us off and to leave that mystery of whether they actually take bathroom breaks or not. I think that's a very intentional Rothfuss thing there. The, um, we did skip over it, so I wanted to mention it. It was never... Uh, so he's walking around and blah, 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 blah. He was looking for... Making things worse was the fact that Braden had left Severin several days ago to visit some nearby relatives. I didn't realize how much I'd come to depend on him until he was gone. So Braden, Denna, both out of town. Oh, yeah. You know what? I actually I read that as that, that he was talking about dinner there. But yeah. So yeah. Braden, yeah. Braden being out of town the same exact time as dinner definitely fucking stands out. And then he comes yeah. back shortly after, you know, she gets back. I would also say um, the fact that he's able to make a uh, gram from memory. It seems like the schema was difficult. I mean, we know it was difficult to find. And I know we know he has a tremendous memory, but still, man, it seems like it's very complicated, right? It's not like people don't make this, right? The, n- nobody else is making this from memory, it seems. Yeah, I mean, right? we see it. He learns a, that cipher in like 15 minutes. Yeah. So but, this guy's yeah. got it's a, I a think fucking it, steel trap of a mind. Yeah, it, well, he he goes as far as saying the schema was no difficulty either as I have a good memory for such things, it seems like a very, uh, understate, very much a big understatement. Yeah. But he's kind of earned because we've read about him. We know, you know, his deal. But yeah. And so dinner comes back on the seventh day, which also stands out that it's the seventh day, which, you know, seven is a massive number in this world. Yeah. So that kind of stands out. I don't know if there's anything to that. There's not any other information that would, give you a clue but it does stand out that she comes back on the seventh day but then you know they don't talk about it like she doesn't you know he doesn't ask her about it he's like i didn't ask her about her unexplained disappearance i'd known denna for more than a year now and i understood a few of the hidden turnings of her heart i knew she valued her privacy i knew she had her secrets which is why you should fucking open up and see you know if by you sharing she'll start to share and maybe you can fucking advance somewhere you shit um but yeah, it's funny how that works but and she you know like she shows she cares like she's like you know i am sorry you know like unprompted unprompted and mm-hmm. like he didn't even know what she was talking about and uh when dinner didn't say anything immediately i turned to look at her there was no there was no moon which there's a lot of theories that dinner might be the moon or a part of the moon and i think that makes it hard because if there is no moon, that means the full moon is in the Fae. And she is definitely not in the Fae at this moment. 
So if you yeah. think like she's the moon, you know, in person, you know, the human manifestation manifestation of the moon seems very hard if she's there with, you know, no moon. But anyway, she's like, sometimes I leave, she said at last, quick and quiet in the night. It's what I do. She continued her voice quiet. I leave. No, no word or warning first. No explanation after. Sometimes it's the only thing I can do. I hope you know without me telling you, she said. I hope you don't. I hope I don't need to say it. Then it turned back to look at the glimmering lights below. But for what it's worth, I am sorry. And then he, this is one of the most frustrating uh, parts of, of this chapter and one of the most frustrating aspects of this book when he's like, we sat for a while then enjoying a comfortable silence. I wanted to say something. I wanted to say it didn't bother me, but that would be a lie. I wanted to tell her that all that really mattered to me was that she'd come back, but I was worried that might be too too much truth. So rather than risk saying the wrong thing, I said nothing. I knew what happened to men who clung to her too tightly. That was the difference between me and the others. I didn't clutch at her, try to own her. I did not slip my arm around her, murmur in her ear, or kiss her unsuspecting cheek. Cer certainly I thought of it. I still remembered the warmth of her she, when she'd thrown her arms around me near the horse lift. There were times I would have given my right arm to hold her again. But then I thought of the faces of the other men when they realized Den was leaving them. I thought of all the others who tried to tie her, tie her to the ground and failed. So I resisted showing her the songs and poems I had written, knowing that too much truth can ruin a thing. And if that meant she wasn't entirely mine, what of it? I would be the one she could always return to without fear of rec recrimination or question. So I did not try to win her or contend uh, and contended myself with playing a beautiful game. It's like, no, you're not. You're not playing a beautiful game. You're playing a fucking weak ass pussy game, man. Yeah. Yeah. This is not a beautiful game. It's, it's, it's uh, putting a bow on it and making it seem like it's uh, he's doing some nuanced, great. You know, he, he's in the friend zone. He's literally put himself in a position where, He's settling for much, much less than what he actually wants and what would actually be better for the for the both of them. Like we just um, heard we heard uh, in chapter 65, Braden talking about like the the beautiful game. And it wasn't about being timid. It was the exact opposite about timid. Yeah, it was like yeah. fucking coming in, kicking in the door and fucking blowing the fucking place up. Like, I mean, he's like, no, nah, man, it's not about being fucking timid. It's about being fucking bold. And daring not, not only that, and fucking going in guns blazing. Not only that, it's also knowing that you could lose and doing it anyway. That's that's like Brayden's whole thing about the beautiful game is going in knowing there's a trap set for you and still overcoming it. Yeah. That's the beautiful game. That's even beyond boldness. I mean, or I guess that's the definition of boldness. Yeah. He's not doing that at all. He know he knows there's risk and he's not willing to take it at all. No. He's not taking any risk here. No. No, yeah. and that I yeah, mean that is not that is a hundred percent not what Braden was describing. That is the opposite of it. It's being very timid, very passive, weak, and it's like, yeah, okay, so you're a good friend, but you want more than that. So like you're well, yeah, you, what the, you're doing is not healthy line, for yourself, man. The next line, but there was always a part of me that hoped for more, and so there was a part of me that was always a fool. You're, there's always a part of me that was a fucking pussy, dude. Like that's half-assed, not even fully willing to do this. So you're lying to yourself that you're playing a beautiful game because you just told yourself that you're hoping for more. And now but that part, you know, just that part's a fool. I, I don't deserve it. Well, and, and granted, like he's telling us this from the future, so he knows what happens, and so it could be the case that yeah, he true. eventually yeah. does tell her these things, and it fucking blows up in his face. And so, but. I I th I think that there there was a way there there was a way where he could have approached her where he could have came at her and said hey look I know you don't need a savior I don't want to be your savior you don't want one you don't need one I don't want to be that but I've got my demons I got my shit that I'm going through could have told her about the Chandrian what happened to his family what is driving him why you know why he had to go to the university and why he has to fucking devote himself there. It's like, it's not, it's not just about, I want to go there and get an education and go get a job and fuck work a nine to five. I got a mission. seems like you've got an agenda. There's something that you're trying to do. You have your secrets. You have your doubt. I'm just putting my cards on the table. I like you. And you know, but I understand like I'm also a person that has an agenda 
and I need to get revenge on the Chandra, but maybe it's something that we can help each other. I can help you with your shit. You can help me with mine. We can just fucking be partners and work together. And maybe, you know, we can make shit work that way. That's a solid uh, presentation. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and it's it's not very new it's not nuanced but that's that's exactly what i think would speak to her is just literally putting it out there yeah obviously he's not willing to do so but that and that's that's the but the, that's the, again the, the frustrating the part is he doesn't attention. even think that that of that as an option it, it, like if he thought of that as an option and then was like but i can't do that and then it'd be like okay He's just, you know, he's got his hangups, yeah, but he doesn't even like it, think of good options. Like none of his options, yeah. like his, he's all, his best option is like, so I'll do nothing. There. Yeah, I mean, talk about putting, putting like, it on dude, a pedestal. No, that I is mean, fucking this, this is, it's, it's an absurd, it's a, a absurdity because it's not even a pedestal. It's literally like, you're not even treating her like a human being. No. You're treating her like some, some, some idea. And yes, you have this figment figmented idea in your mind but you've known her for years man the two of you have grown together like (laughs) i mean again it speaks to his his brokenness um and that complexity with within it but yeah it's very frustrating yeah super frustrating especially when you see him in the next chapter but one thing i did i did want to point out real quick um it it, he mentions it briefly but then it reappears on the seventh day Despite all my searching, excited to tell me about a song she'd heard the day before. I wonder if, and they don't talk about the song here, but I wonder if that the song has helped shape what ended up becoming her song that she wrote that, you know, creates a bit of a rift between the two of them. I don't know. I was just curious because it doesn't get mentioned. It's just she's excited about this song. Yeah, but she tells him about it. She tells him yeah, about we don't, the song. Well, yeah, I guess I guess he would mention it if there was significance to it. Yeah, I think it's just like oh, uh, a salt and pepper song. Hold on, salt and pepper? Yeah, salt, oh, salt and salt, pepper. Salt and pepper. You've heard of them, right? That band? That that band? Yeah, that famous band. Hmm. Have you heard of them? It's, I've heard of salt and pepper, and it's a duo, and they have uh, they do have a, the DJ Spinderella, right? Uh no, yes, Cinde- I've heard of Cinderella, Cinderella. You're saying, it wrong. <laughs> and it's pepper, pepper, pepper is how you say that word. I know what pepper is, but I'm saying that's not. Oh, this is stupid. Yeah, you haven't heard of the song like "Push It," Salt and Pepper's famous song, "Push It." There you go, "Push yeah, It" real good. Ah, yeah. see, it's see, she, and Dana was probably telling him that too. She was like, they're, "Hey, I heard this great song. It, it was like, like crazy. ah, push it." You know, like you, you could push it real good. Push it, you know, like push it. And there was awesome. Push the boundaries, it. buddy. Yeah. Take yeah. a risk, she you like, fucking yeah, weak like, dude. <laughs> There's a lot more than, you know, you could put your arm around me. He's like, but really? The lyrics are, him. you could push it, you weak ass bitch, dude. <laughs> like, that's just, that, that doesn't even rhyme. Like, yeah, that's the song. Like, you should take a risk, take a gamble, push it, you weak ass little bitch. <laughs> he still doesn't get it. No, so it's not saying it. Well, that's no. interesting. Uh, it's, it's really know, that's that a song, there. I guess. Yeah. I don't like it. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah then, we do get more of their uh, how how much they compliment one another as they kind of go in. They talk about music. We spent countless hours discussing the craft of it. How songs fit together, how chorus and verse play against each other. Like, dude, they're like a perfect complement to one another. Yeah, I like the I like the description of how she plays music because yeah, he talks great. about how, how he knew all the proper ways to do it, and he's like, "Then it didn't." She lives without roles, yeah. And he's like, That's "In great. some ways, it hampered her, but in other ways, it made her music strange and marvelous." Doing a poor job of explaining this. Think of music as being a great snarl of a city like Tar- Tarbian. In the years I spent living there, I came to know its streets, not just the main streets, not just the alleys. I knew I knew shortcuts and rooftops and parts of the sewers. Because of this, I could move through the city like a rabbit in a bramble. I was quick and cunning and clever. Denna, on the other hand, had never been drained. She knew nothing of shortcuts. You'd think she'd be forced to wander the city lost and helpless, trapped in a twisting maze of mortared stone. But instead, she simply walked through the walls. She didn't know any better. Nobody had ever told her she couldn't. Because of this, she moved through the city like some fairy creature. 
She walked roads no one could el- else could see, and it made her music wild and strange and free. Which a, a lot of I people like- look at and they hear that and they think like Denim must be part Fay or she's from the Fay or or the Moon and that kind of stuff. It's one of those hints towards people thinking like there's something about her in that that aspect there, with her music being so different. I- I, I could see that. I do like, um, I like just looking at it from a perspective of, of Kvothe and his character. I like that he struggles. He struggles to talk about Denna early on and says, you know, he, he's basically hampered and can't describe it. And with music, he's also struggling here. So he's struggling with the two of them. And then he does actually use an analogy that is really good, right? It, I mean, at least for me, it really helps me to understand what he's talking about and the fact that. The idea of like there's walls to a structure that makes up a song and she doesn't even see the walls, which is cool. I mean, the, the, you can sort of picture that and that, you know, that that lack of a structure frees you up, but then also makes it seem strange and different because it's not fitting in to what would be the typical, you know, pop structure of a song yeah. that you love so much. Yeah. Your instinct or in sync and your 98 in sync, whatever. Come on, man. New kids on the block. That's all I listen to, <laughs> but yeah. And then it, it, the chapter ends with him talking about like he, he does help the mayor get with Malawin. He says, In the end, it took 23 letters, six songs, and though it shames me to say it, one poem. Even so, I can only take a small piece of credit for it for the letters and songs. And as for the poem, there's only one thing in the world that can move me to such madness. So I was thinking he's implying their love, attraction, but what I think he's really implying that's in the subtext the is, well, I was going to say the badass nature of slam poetry. It's, he's it's not, no, bringing he, him in that, even here. That, it's going to take Ambrose to, no, but to think, bring out his love of slam poetry, slam jam poetry. But, but he, he's Denna, he's, he's putting out the breadcrumbs now. Yeah, he's feeling well, it. he's wrote one. He's broke the ice at least. And but yeah, it's gonna take. He he's got to hear some. He's got to hear like Ambrose, you know, snapping for himself and shit. And <laughs> once he starts hearing that, yeah, he's gonna be super into slam jam poetry. I think it was. Den, I think he's talking about Dennis' ears though. Could be they come up uh, very soon. Yep. I think in the next chapter. Yep, they definitely do. Those sexy ass ears. But yeah, and you know, in chapter 70, titled Clinging, this is the chapter where he takes Denna to the gardens and to see the Cellus flower. It's a fantastic fucking chapter. Yeah. This is yeah, I think what you were saying earlier where they kind of hit their peak. We count we get it here. We get this the moment of like we're right there. Yeah. We're right at that moment of like this is when it's going to happen, and then they hear something. Yeah, they get interrupted they where it was just like, dude, you should have fucking acted. As soon as you saw the opening, you should have acted. Like, you shouldn't have fucking yeah. hesitated. But, yeah. 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 They had that moment, and uh, it, it went away. So, yeah, then he, he goes and sees her, and he says, you know, I'll, I'll admit I was surprised. I said, if I was the sort of man to... And, he meets her at the late at night and talking about like, you know, how, you know, it, it's, it, it might be uncouth to see her this late at night. So he's like, if I was the sort of man to pry, I would wonder what kept you occupied until this most unseemly hour business. She said with a dramatic sigh, meeting with my patron, he's in town again. I asked, she nodded a- and he wanted to meet you at midnight. I asked, that's odd, odd times and inconvenient places are the rule with master ash. Some part of me suspects he might simply be lo- a lonely noble, bored with or- ordinary patronage. I wonder if it adds some spice for him, pretending he's meshed in some dark intrigue instead of just commissioning some songs for me. That to me, like if that, if that's Cinder, like man, he's got to be just the, an amazing fucking actor, because Dana yeah. can read fucking people like the back of a book. Like I mean, that's fucking her thing is to be able to read and hustle people Cinder's just working the shit out of Denna one, one of the things that that kind of revealed to me which I, I think we, we don't 100% know Denna's being 
fully, fully honest about how much she knows about Master Ash, this kind of shows you a little bit further that she she wasn't bullshitting. That no. she doesn't. There's a lot she doesn't know, and that kind of get got at least revealed here to a degree for me that that wasn't bullshit. That she's it's not just that she's holding back. She's being careful to hold certain things back, but she legitimately doesn't know that much about them, and she's still sort of figuring out more and more about them. I mean, I mean it also shows she does think that there's something some dark intrigue about it like there is Mm -hmm. something sinister about her commissioning this song some dark intrigue at least you know so that could be either brayden or cinder i mean that that definitely could but the the just the the bored lonely noble and shit like that's how you describe cinder yeah that that's a that's a that's very, very I mean, way out of we, we know how good of an actor Kavoth is, and she and spots his that, lies fucking like nothing. Yeah. She catches him in his lies constantly. Well, and that 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 lonely noble really fits with Brayden too, man. <laughs> like it totally fits. That's yeah, like it would fit perfectly because he like is. he does give yeah. you that impression of where you could see him as a bored, lonely noble when you describe what he's doing with Kavoth. Yeah. He's talking about his beautiful game and he's playing tack and, you know, he's not, he, oh, I don't get into those he, games, but he's kind of yeah, halfway, you know, semi in yeah. into those games. Well, like he, he used to do it. Now he's bored with it. Yeah. But he still knows it. You know, like it, I mean, that's, that's what it, it speaks of. Yeah. So that, it, it, that's one of those clues where it seems much more towards Brayden than Cinder, but you know, it's not definitive by any stretch, but again, a lot of those clues, I think, you know, pen, Point much better towards uh, Brayden than Cinder, mm-hmm. but she tells him she doesn't have any plans. So he's like, "Great, you know, let me, you know, I, I, I got uh, something for you. I, I have something to show you. It's a surprise. You'll have to trust me." And she says, "I've heard each of those a dozen times. Then his dark eyes glittering wickedly, but never all together, and never from you." She smiled. I'll give you the benefit benefit of the doubt and say my world weary jibes for later. Take me where you will. And he takes her to a, a hayloft and she's like, you know, takes her to the Sorry. barn to sneak in. And he's, yeah. She's like a hayloft. She demanded her voice incredulous. She stopped walking and gave me an odd, curious look. You obviously have me mistaken for a 14 year old farm girl named her mouth worked silently for a moment. Something rustic. Greta, I suggested. Yes, she said. You obviously have me mistaken for a low bodice farm girl named Greta. Rest assured, I said, if I were going to seduce you, this isn't the way I would go about it. So yeah, you wouldn't do shit. This seems like the classical move, the hayloft. Yeah. I mean, it seems so perfect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be a pretty weak ass move with Denna, but yeah, yeah I mean but... Kavoth could do better than that. But yeah. No, you're weak. You wouldn't well, and he do does. Shit. He he does a tremendous job. I, dude, this whole thing, uh, this is like Kavoth, in in my opinion, this in a big way is Kavoth at his best. In terms of how how he their their whole back and forth and this whole idea of like yeah anyone can you know or there's plenty of people that can take you to these gardens who can sneak you in like that whole thing is fucking the, the the whole whole thing it's like yeah if I was trying to seduce you this is exactly what I would do <laughs> like this whole yeah. fucking thing yeah. is how I would go about <laughs> it and it's like yeah and it worked it was fucking great and if if you weren't such a fucking coward with her then you know it, it would have fucking went further but yeah yeah it, it, it plays into her personality so well as well and she admits it she even she's like oh you know my secret heart so well that the whole thing where it's like something that would be appealing yet there's this bend on it and it's the fact that we're not supposed to be in here or that we came in in this this particular way even though well that that's an interesting thing too. Is well, I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead, but that's an interesting thing as well. Is once they get to, uh, once they realize like they had permission, then it's like not nearly as fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But one of the one of the also big parts is when she's like, you know, is that so? She said, running her hand through her hair, her fingers began to idly mm-hmm. twine her hair into a braid. Then she stopped and brushed it out. In that case, what are we doing here? So after he says, you know, if I were going to seduce you, this isn't the way I would go about it. And she starts twiddling something in her hair. I think she's like, do it. 
show me what you would do, something along those lines. And then she's like, mm-hmm. no, I'm not going to manipulate him like that is what I interpret yeah. that as. It's a good, it's good timing to throw in that, uh, that motif with her idly braiding her hair again. Yeah. It's I think the, she was clearly a, trying to do magic. Thing. I think that, I mean, because when we see the, you know, she writes beautiful in the hair and don't talk to me and shit like that. Like, I think that is, this is a clear example of her. She's, she was going to use magic on him. And I think given the circumstances, I think she was probably going to fucking be like, yo, make your fucking move, dude. And then she's yeah. like, no, I'm not going to manipulate. I like Kavoth. I'm not going to manipulate him into doing this. He, if he does it, it's going to be because he wants to. Yeah. But yeah, I think that is one of those times, you know, that she does start to do magic with her, with her braids. But then, um, yeah, then he makes the, you know, the tells her about, you know, I can sneak you in here. Anybody can, you know, walk you through the front door. I can sneak you in. So, and she's like, yeah, you know, you know, my secret heart so well. And then he's like, he's standing by the ladder and she's like, hold on, you aren't being genteel. You're trying to get a look up my dress. I give her my best offended look, pressing my hand to my chest. Lady, as a gentleman, I assure you, she swatted at me. You've already told me you're not a gentleman. She said, you're a thief and you're trying to sneak a look. Which I hope he was. Good for him. Fucking. <laughs> uh, his other shit is all, you know, weak as shit. So, yeah, trying to get a little little peek, you know. At least, at least there's some kind of bravery in that. So, I hope, I hope that was the case. Except he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have looked up. He wouldn't have took a peek. No, not only would he have not have looked up, he would have pointed out that he would never do something no, like that. I would never look never, up. Ever. And never not only look would I up. never do that, I would never think to look up. She's just standing on the fucking ladder twerking. And he's like, I'm not going to look up. <laughs> She's like, no, I want you to look up. He's like, I, you're not going to get me to fall for that one. <laughs> He's like, God damn it, man. I, there's nothing I can do to get this guy. <laughs> But then, um, yeah, then so he he's he brings her into the garden and he's like, I don't know if uh, you remember, I said softly, not wanting to in, intrude upon the silence. A conversation we had some time ago, we talked to flowers. I remember she said just as softly, you said you thought all men, you said you thought, thought all men had their lessons in uh, courting from the same worn book. Oh, I'd forgotten. I did say that, didn't I? I nodded. You said they all brought brought you roses. They still do, she said. I wish they'd find a new book. You made me pick a flower you would, that would suit you better. I said. She smiled up at me shyly. I remember. I was testing you. Then she frowned. But you got the better of me by picking a flower I'd never heard of, let alone seen. I don't know if you've uh, seen them yet, I said, but here is the, your cellist flower. There were only stars lighting our way. The moon was so slender it was almost no moon at all. Under the trellis, it was dark as Dennis' hair. Her eyes were wide and stretching to the stretching to the dark, and where the starlit slanted through the leaves, they showed hundreds of cellus blooms yawning open in the night. If the scent of cellus were not so delicate, it would have been, been overpowering. Oh, Dennis sighed, looking around with wide eyes. Under the bower, her skin was brighter than the moon. She reached out her hands to both sides. They're so soft. It's a fucking pretty fucking pimp move i mean when you you know when you think about their relationship and the fact that you know this is what he brings her to like i remember i I commented on that one time and like like someone was like uh it's like oh dude you're gonna fucking struggle with fucking women man like if you can't (laughs) recognize that 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 was a fucking pimp move by uh like man girls are not guys dude gonna have to fucking learn that at some point yeah it's great I mean the the whole the whole situation how it plays out. He gets they talk about it again, and then boom, they're right there. I like how he writes that if the scent of the cellos were not so delicate, it would have been overpowering. The idea that it's you know this rare, delicate, hard to uh, cultivate flower, and then also the fact that like it has this scent, but it's a delicate scent. In which case, it's not you know it fits her in that sense as well. It's not over the top it's well i guess maybe it smells like the road yeah right dirt and sweat spittle sweaty sweaty sex modegan women that sweat and sex yeah. but yeah and then he's but, and it's like the you know the silence stretched until i started growing comfortable so now you know your flower i said it seemed a shame you'd never seen one they're rather difficult to cultivate from what i've heard 
Perhaps they do suit me then, Dennis said softly looking down. I don't take root easily. And, you know, it gets a little quiet. And she then gets, she's like, you, she gets real. You treat me better than I deserve, Dennis said at last. I laughed at the ridiculousness of that. Only respect for the silence of the garden kept me, kept it from rolling out of me in great booming laugh. Instead, I stifled it as much as possible, though the effort threw me off my stride and made me stumble. Dennis watched me for a step from a step away, smile spreading across her mouth. But th that's one of those things where you see that Dennis has got, you know, a similar problem as Kvothe. I mean, they, we constantly talk about how they mirror each other. That's that's a perfect example of their mirroring. Like she does, mm -hmm. does not see herself as worth the effort that he puts in. Yes, a hundred percent. But then I also wonder, I also wonder if it's because they're, he, they're not in the roles that would make it more appropriate. I don't know. You know, like, cause I think she's got some fucking, some skeletons in her closet. And so I think she doesn't I, no, I feel like she deserves it. That's undeniable. I yeah I, yeah but well in the fact that she she says it that's her opening up yeah you know what I mean? and she's done that a couple times where she's like you know where she insinuates and bl like blankly just tells him and you know and like it it, it could be that you know like his agenda is getting revenge but her agenda could be righting a wrong maybe she did something wrong that ended up in disaster. And so she's trying to right that wrong. And whereas his is he's seeking revenge. So, they, they, you know, they, they have their agendas, but they could be different. And like that, I mean, that hints at that where she's like, you know, I don't deserve mm -hmm. you. But it, it could be any number of things because Kavoth doesn't think he deserves her or deserves to be with someone or anybody he, would want to be with him. Yeah, it, it almost feels like he, he thinks he's not worthy. Yeah. Um, it seems like, yeah, I guess that, that makes a lot of sense, actually, that she she more thinks it's it's a different sort of similar, but different. Worthy. Yeah. It's, like, I mean, it's yeah, more, it's like well, one doesn't think that, you know, can't understand why anybody wants to be with them. Not so much that they don't deserve it. It's just like, yeah, but why would anybody want me? And then hers is more like, I don't deserve it. Like she gets why people would like her, but she doesn't feel like she's she's worthy so, of their fucking love yeah it's more like she's putting on a show it's not real yeah you know what i mean like like she's she's playing a role which is interesting because that's what kavoth does in so many circumstances as well I mean, he's a fucking actor right yeah but yeah and then so it goes to you know uh it's quite a thing she said there's so many men all in endlessly or wait, no, for, before that, she's like, four, four days ago, I turned my foot on that loose flagstone, she said softly. Remember, we were walking on Mincet Lane. My foot slipped and you caught me almost before I, I knew that I was stumbling. It made me wonder how closely you must be watching me to see something so something like that. You had your hands on me then, sure as anything, st steady in me. You almost had your arms around me. It would have been so easy for you then, a matter of inches. But when I got to my feet beneath me, you took your hands away. No hesitation, no lingering, nothing I may take amiss. It's quite a thing, she said. There are so many men all endlessly attempting to sweep me off my feet, and there is one of you trying just the opposite, making sure my feet are firm beneath me, lest I fall. Almost, she, almost shyly, she reached out. When I moved to take your arm, you accept it easily. You even lay your hand on mine, as if to keep it there. She explained my movement exactly as I was making it, and I fought to keep from keep the gesture from becoming suddenly awkward, but that's all you never presume you never push. Do you know how strange that is to me? We looked at each other for a moment there in the silent moonlight garden. I could feel the heat of her standing close to me, her hand clinging to my arm and experienced as I was with women. Even I could read this cue. I tried to think of what I, what to say, but I could only uh, wonder at her lips. How could they be so red as, as this? Even the cellist was dark in the faint moonlight. How were her lips so red? Like two things. One, I, I tried to think what to say. There's nothing to say, dude. Just fucking kiss her at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? And Stop. It, yeah. Stop thinking, dude. Yeah. Just fucking like, react. Is, well, not, but you also skipped over. You could put your arm around me, you know, like, 
they have a back and forth where he says he basically is like, you've done all these things for me. You know, you sung yeah. as my Elohim. You gave me a loot case, which saved my life. Did I tell you about that? Yeah, it literally saved my life. Like, I owe you. And she's like, well, this is a great start. And and then she goes as far as, I've always liked Moonless Nights best. It's easier to say things in the dark. It's easier to be yourself. I mean, she's laying it on here. And then you could put your arm around me, you know? Like, <laughs> we're walking the gardens alone in the moonlight, such as it is. Such things are permitted, you realize, and just keeps going in that direction. And I like that. Th- I like too that he mentions he's like her sudden change in manner caught me off guard. Since we had met in Severn, I'd courted her with wild, hopeless pageantry, and she had matched me without missing a beat. Each flatter, each each wit- witticism, each piece of playful banner she returned to me, not in an echo, but a harmony. Her back and forth had been like a duet, but this was different. Her tone was less playful and more plain. It was yeah. it was it was so sudden a change that I was at a loss for words. That's a perfect example of you know an aspect of them we've talked about a lot in in that it, it they it's like they are you know singing a song or making a play doing a dance where it's not real and then she is you know at that moment she's being real like dude you could she, fucking try something man yeah like she's I basically am basically treating this she she's basically like oh so this is a date. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so we are actually on a date now. This is you and me. This is not a fucking play. We're not joking. Around. Like, it's just us. We don't have to put on a fucking show. I don't have, you know, Jared DeBrickshaw next yeah. to me. Like, this is just us. You know, and he, he, he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do when it's not acting, you know? And Jared, uh, Jared does I, not have a brick jaw. Kellen is yeah I, yeah I know Rick I'm just man. saying any of those I'm just saying any of those dudes yeah but I, Ke- I like her at, Kellen's the fucking greatest no, character sorry. in this book so Since you like him so don't be much. giving everybody else his eh, job his great Al is better um I do like the analogy the analogy she uses tremendous like the idea of well I mean Rothfuss give credit swept off my feet versus feet firmly on the ground yeah which is it's a really interesting I, I remember long, long, long time ago, a, a woman describing to me that this is something that so many women basically need is affirmation that their feet are on the ground right now or at all times, you know, just that affirmation, that reassurance that shit is okay. Things are okay. Like that instability uh, is a problem for a lot of people, not just women. It's a, it's a problem for everybody to some degree is having that instability, which can really run around in their mind and they need reassurance. And that's a big part of what a lot of people look for in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're a dude, you probably, you want to be a rock man. Like well, and, and, whatever well, you gotta do, whatever you gotta do to be, be the rock, you need to be the rock. I mean, especially, but what, and that's, what's so interesting about what she's constantly, she's sh- staying here. I'm, Dude, these guys that are trying to sweep her off her feet doesn't fucking work. I don't need you to buy me everything in my vicinity. Now, when she does get something, she can turn around and use it. Fine. That dude's not going to be around. She's going to have the thing that she can then pawn. She can give a fuck about the guy because that's not what she's looking for. You know? Yeah. She's looking for that stability, but her own version of that stability where it's her own. Right? Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, if you're a guy, you kind of, you got to work your shit out during the good times because when shit shit hits the fan, you got to be the fucking got to be the fucking rock man. <laughs> like guy, I mean, yeah. like I in most relationships, you know, ninety nine percent of relationships, you better be the fucking stable force when shit hits the fan. The guy that fucking you know deaths in the family, bad shit happens. Someone needs a shoulder. You need to be the fucking shoulder. You can't be fucking. Yeah, fu- not everybody can be losing their fucking shit. It's a funny, uh, and it, this isn't directly related to that, but it's it's kind of in, in a way related that this for so much of like for for my life, I'm like I'm I'm bringing so much shit to the table, and then you realize until you get older, you're like, oh, I wasn't really bringing much to the table <laughs> <laughs> until like you start to get a little bit older, and you're like, oh, so I actually, you know, it, it's all relative, you know. And as you start to advance as a human being, you're like, now I actually do have a lot more to offer other individuals early on you're just like you know ridiculous amount of self-confidence in yourself not not being cognizant of the fact that you're not actually bringing much to the to the table for another individual yeah and actually being able to to provide or take care of them emotionally as well as uh, you know just financially 
But there's a um, another thing uh, about that is when she talks about like the, you know, some people are trying to sweep me off my feet, whereas you're trying to put my feet firmly on the ground and let me stand on my own. Yeah. She expressly is telling you what she wants. Like that should have been a huge clue to you. Like what she wants. Like she's not looking for someone to sweep her off her feet, to carry her, to take care of her, someone to help her stable herself and then let her fucking do her thing. Maybe write the ship every now and again, not, not to control her and, and, you know, carry her across the water, but to, you know, set her down, fucking stable her, make sure she's steady. That kind of thing she's into. What's interesting is her, uh, her comment where she goes as far as, but that's all you never presume you never push. Do you know how strange that is? It doesn't seem like she's only saying that's strange in a good way because she's told that enough. We get it. You know, is she's being, she's going further here. She's opening up a little bit further. It almost seems like in, in a way it's like, well, dude, do you, do you want anything? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like, it, it would be this... strange because he's obviously giving signals yeah. that he's into her, but then fucking he's giving a bunch of signals that he's not into her. Yeah. And that's because she keeps saying. telling that's him, what, like, hey, you can make a move. That. You yeah. can try something. You could do something. And he's just like, oh, no, I hear you. Yeah, I got you. So, so okay. So I guess so I read the signals all gonna... wrong. You're not going to do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I just told you that, you could do yeah, it. And you didn't do it. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. It's like, okay, so when's this going to happen? Like, what what's it going to – am I going to be on my deathbed and then finally you're going to make a move? Like, what, what's going on here, man? Yeah. What, what's it going to take? You'd put your arm around me. Boom. Arm around her. Right there. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Let's fucking do it. What are you doing, you weak-ass fucking, fucking kid, man? But, yeah. Then – um you know, says, you know, someone's coming and then it's, it's the no, mayor. Well, I, I was going to say, cause it ties in so well with what you just said. And it, I know we made this point, but it, it should be pointed out here. Inexperienced as I was with women, even I could read this cue. I tried to think of what to say. It's like that line right there. You're like, fuck dude. I mean, I know you said that a minute ago, but mm-hmm. that's, that's the thing where it's like, man, you're really you just fucking get it. I wanted to point this out because it's been in, it's been talked about uh, quite a bit, and especially in book two, where he keeps talking about Denna's red lips. Yeah, and then he did talk about it as well with uh, Mellowin, without paint, yet they're red. You know, and he keeps pointing out it seems like there's something to it, man. And it could maybe not, but I. It just, hey, I mean, it could be. It's, it yeah, so it's it's it definitely stands out the way he says it, but. Without any other information, it's it could be a clue that we're going to find out about in the next book. But yeah, it's at this point, it's it's impossible to really tell without more information on what what the significance of that is. But yeah, they talk about with you know Malewin, they talk Ari, you know, with the rue she puts on her her lips or the berry or whatever. But that, that's not really lipstick or whatever. But well, with her and Mellowin, and especially, he makes a point of saying they they're not wearing anything. Yeah, you know what I mean. We don't know what it could be something, but he makes a point of saying there isn't anything, and he's said that a number of times. That's what I was saying a minute ago. When uh, I find it impressive that we're in book two, all these pages of reading about Denna, yet he's still able to give more details about her that he hasn't given before, and one of them was the lips, and I hadn't really brought it up in the past. You know, I don't know forty. 30, 40 chapters that it seems that they've been in there, but uh, that he's been mentioning this, but thought I'd mention it now because we just ought to also got it with Melon. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely stands out. It's just, we need more information to really know what the fuck it means. Some people speculate that Denna is also a lackless and I hope that is not the route Rothfuss goes. I hope it is. Yeah. I've also heard uh, the grossest theory I've heard is someone say that Flurian is actually Lorian. And I'm like, dude, no, no, Ugh. no. I will burn these books if Flurian is Kavot's mom. Like, no, that cannot be the case. Dude, that's so that's so weird because that's not even like an Oedipus thing. That's just that's just disturbing. Yes. It's such a weird like, and, you know what that and, reminds and, me and of? His that mom would know. Of... Like, she would know. She would know that's her kid. Like, it'd that be reminds so me messed of, up. Like, 
it's not it's not even it's not direct, but it reminds me of like the Ray Finkel thing, where it's like when they find out, everybody's like, whoa, everybody's <laughs> yeah. like clicking their mouths out. <laughs> it reminds me of that because like, what else do you get out of this? It's just disgusting. Um, yeah, ugh. Um, I have had a few a few times where it's like, is Dina his cousin? Dude, if is there is their bloodline related in some way? I, I man, I hope they don't go that route. Like, there's enough fucking incest stories uh we can take a break on incest stories like fucking give, I don't, I give don't, a I rest i mean but in, in so in these contexts the the circumstances that you just described it does not add anything that makes the story more interesting as far oh, as i'm concerned it's fucking gross like it's not a it's not a it's not a twist that's like oh well that's cool yeah, I mean, it's like no it's fucking disturbing yeah it yeah yeah, I, I I don't want him to go that route. I would not be a fan. I would be very disappointed. But yeah, then uh, so they they see he's like you know that's the mayor and his uh, young lady love. Oh, and, and before that he's like uh, her hair fell like a curtain down the side of her head, and the tipper of her ear was peeking out through it. It was at that moment the most lovely thing I had ever seen. Did you know Bast is listening to this story right now? And Kavoth is getting very <laughs> fucking pornographic. Like Bass is like face is like he's getting like, flushed. Is you know his fucking temperatures rising. He's like, whoo, yeah. it's fucking getting hot in here. Crotch. So steamy, dude. It it it's a, it it is it is a weird thing. Um, this makes me think Rothfuss is, has an ear thing because the how he says it, it's it was the. At that moment, the most lovely thing that I had ever seen. Dude, he's looking her in her eyes. He's looking at her lips. He's, you know. <laughs> he was just staring at her. The about ear, ready. To, the they tip. were about ready to kiss. And then he's just like, yeah, but that ear. That ear wasn't yeah, showing like, from the front. The hair is covering him now. I see the tip. I see that tip of the ear. Yeah. This is lovelier than that this yeah so what was he laughing about ear. fucking uh bass see this might be kavoth yeah, kavoth point. reacting to what bass said and bass convinced him he's playing that the ears audience. are big or he is just putting in some porn for fucking bass sake he's just playing to, he's he's just barely looking over like yeah kavoth uh, would and kavoth would do that he plays to his audience so he's probably i think he's just putting in porn for bass <laughs> It definitely stood out to me where it's like, and we hear a lot about her, you know, her beautiful ears, but yeah, it, it's funny because I hadn't made that connection where it, it is, Kvothe is like, yeah, what are you talking about, Bass? Yeah. Like, I think you, you made the ears. Point. It's enough. Yeah. It's enough, bro. Yeah. Um, it was the, 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 the best thing I've ever seen was when I saw the tip of her ear. The lo- he, I mean, he does say it's the loveliest thing he's ever seen, and he's been cl- cl- Close to Denna in a lot of other situations. Yeah, he's seen her like showing scandalous amount of fucking leg and and breast and shit. And then he's like, "Yeah, but she showed me ear tip. Yep. That was it. Tip of the ear. Ear tip. Not even full ear. She he didn't even see full ear. He just saw the tip of an ear. It, it, by the way, is that even the the best part of the ear? The tip, of course." <laughs> We're talking about the top, right? Yeah. That's the tip, right? Yeah. Okay. It's, I, I, it's 100% the best. 100%. Okay. Like, if you're going to, like, you know, suck on it. <laughs> you can't even say it. <laughs> you can't even say it. <laughs> uh, the visual of, like, sucking the top of it here. <laughs> Oh, by the way, oh, by the way, if you, it. if you, by the way, <laughs> if you are going to, it's not even a natural part to go to. No, it's the fucking the, weirdest the, part you can go to. Yeah. to like <laughs> you know, the earlobe would be the normal thing that people go the, to, but like, yeah, yeah, to suck on the tip of the ear. Oh man, <laughs> that visual fucking got me. <laughs> the fucking tears in my eyes. The bottom. Uh, of the you know the lobe the side would be or more accessible. It'd be very weird to try to get your tongue into here. <laughs> but yeah, the tip is strange. It's, you don't even lick uh, it. You just you gotta suck on the tip. 
<laughs> oh man, I gave this girl such a good ear job. <laughs> oh man, should have seen her face. She couldn't even take it. She left immediately. She got so aroused she couldn't take it. It's like, no, I think you weirded her out, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. She was just like, I have to go to bed now. Yeah. She was just, you know, I just, I, you know, I, I guess we were done. It was so good for her. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, good stuff. But yeah, then, uh, so they see it's the mayor, and I like that the uh, the mayor as he's walking by. It's like not for you, my dear. I heard the mayor say as clearly as they pass near us. You shall, uh, you shall have nothing but roses. Then it turned to look at me, her eyes wide. She pressed both her hands against her mouth to stifle her laughter. He has a copy of the same worn book, she said, her eyes dancing. I couldn't help but smile, apparently. So that's Mare, she said quietly, her dark eyes peering between the leaves. He's shorter than I imagine. So <laughs> I think uh, he's, probably, he's probably like 4'9", like you, a little short guy, a little <laughs> shrimp. But I uh, love the uh, I love the shorter than I imagined that celebrity yeah. like conundrum yeah. that exists. Yeah, which dude, I swear, man, it you, you the celebrity is either six one if it's a guy, he's either six one, or wow, he's shorter than I thought he'd be, or he's way taller than I thought he'd be. You know what I'm saying? Like he's six two. Wow, he's super tall. I if think six one or six foot. Then it's like, oh, that's what I expected. Like. <laughs> I you think it was saying? one like, of the uh, Stormlight um, episodes we recorded recently where we were talking about like going up to celebrities, no matter how tall they are, and be like, like man, or how short they are. Like, man, you're way taller than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> like if they're like five, English. six, they're like, man, you're way taller than I expected. Like, <laughs> well, how tall did you think I was? I was like, mm, like three, six. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea what? of doing that to someone that like notoriously like Tom Cruise. Yeah. It's like, whoa, dude, you are huge. Everybody talks about it, like you know, you're short, but dude, you're huge. Man. Yeah. You're like High a five. you're like a normal sized person. <laughs> I thought you were like freakishly small. That dude, that'd be great if you're like six two and to do that and then be like, high five. Yeah. Put it way up where yeah. you can't even reach it. Reach way up. <laughs> like <laughs> Stand on your tiptoes, reaching as high as you possibly can. <laughs> like, I, this dude is trolling me in the weirdest way. Uh, but yeah, so then he's like, uh, would you would you like to meet him, I asked? I could introduce you. Oh, that would be lovely, she said with a gentle edge of mockery. She chuckled, but when I didn't join her laughter, she looked up at me and stopped. You're serious? Probably shouldn't burst out of the hedge at him, I admitted. But we could come out on the other side and loop around to meet him. Gesture with my hand at the route we could take. I'm not saying he'll invite us to dinner or anything, but we can make a polite nod as we pass on the path. Denna continued to stare at me, her eyebrows eyebrows furrowing at the, in the uh, faint beginning of a frown. You're serious, she repeated. What do you... I stopped as I realized what her expression meant. You thought I was lying about working for the mayor, I said. You thought I was lying about being able to invite you in here. Men tell stories, she said dismissively. They like to brag a bit. I didn't think any less of you for telling me a bit of a tall tale. And then this is a great line, too, where he's like, you know, I wouldn't uh, lie to you, I said. Then reconsidered. No, that's not the truth. I would. You're worth lying for. But I wasn't. You're worth telling the truth for, too. Then it gave me a fond smile. That's harder to come by anyways. So would you like to, I asked, meet him? I mean, she looked out of the hedge towards the path. No. When she shook her head and her hair moved uh, like drifting shadows. I believe you. There's no need. She looked down. Besides, I got grass stands on my dress. What would he think? I've got leaves in my hair, I admitted. I know exactly what he would think. And then Denna looked up as we uh, passed the statue of a woman picking a flower. She sighed. It was more exciting when I didn't know we had permission. She admitted with a little regret in her voice. It always is, I agreed. Oh, and then, I, you I like know, and also, too, you know, he realizes when they go to leave, he's like, you know, Thought about putting my arm around her, but yeah, no, nah, the moment had passed. It's like, nah, I would have worked that moment back. I would have fought for that fucking yeah. moment. Like, oh yeah, that's right. We talked about this. If I'm him and I'm like desperately in love with this girl and we got that close where we're like staring at each other in the face and he's like, even I knew, like I should be kissing her right now. 
It's like, no, no, no. We need to figure out a way to get back there. The, yeah, the night yeah. is still young enough. We can, I can, I can save this. I can fucking work it back. Thing is, man, I, I, it's so hard for me to put myself in that position. I, I don't have that type of patience. I just don't. I would, I would have shot my shot already. You know what I'm saying? Like, like when you're trying to explain it in that way. Yeah, of course. I would have, I would have tried. I mean, cause, yeah, you can't. I mean, it's just completely unrealistic. Now, I didn't, obviously didn't live his life and all, but. But that line you were talking about a moment ago, I think, is one, should be one of the most stolen lines from this book uh, for people that are in a relationship and they get you know caught in a lie. Yeah, because then you you, of, like, you yeah, should worth lying you know, for. Like yeah, but I lied, but I lied just because you are worth lying to. Like what? And oh. The girl's gonna be like, "What does that fucking mean?" Like it's well, a compliment. It's a compliment. Like I'm saying, like you know, you're worth lying to. Like if you're not a piece of shit, like a piece of shit's not worth lying to. You just tell him flat out, "You're great," so I'm willing to lie to you. Like oh, well, that well, makes me feel also, really good. You're worth telling the truth for too. So you got to kind of throw them both in there and nuance it out. But yeah, but yeah, I don't. I just, don't <laughs> recommend. Um, Telling that to a girl, unless it's in almost the exact same situation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not just saying yeah, throw I it know, out there at the, the first time, but hey, like uh, first date, like you know what, you're fucking banging. I would definitely lie to you. I would tell you the truth too, <laughs> but I would definitely lie to you. You're totally worth lying to. That's your your pickup line is you're worth lying for. Yeah, that's what you you come in with. Um, yeah. I, I and I, I like the. Uh, it was more exciting when uh, I knew when we didn't have permission. That definitely uh, speaks to. I, I remember, man. It made me kind of remember, uh, like we you know, toilet papering houses as a kid. And I remember we were going somewhere to toilet paper house, a house or whatever. And like someone in the group was like, "Yeah, we're going to this place," and it was like their house, and it was like <laughs> the parents were in on it, like they knew. I'm like. Well, this is stupid. This is not fun like, it's at only, all. F- yeah, it's only fun to do if you're not supposed to do it. Dude, and I, you think you might get chased. I, once, got, I once went to TP a house and uh, we got there and one of the neighbors like came out onto the driveway as like a bunch of cars pulled up. I, you know, we we're like probably three or four houses down. And then he's just standing there watching us with all these cars just like parked on the side of the road late at super late at night. And everybody, you know, we got fucking a shit ton of toilet paper in our cars. And, like, they're like, the, the, everybody's like, oh, let's just get out of here and, you know, maybe try it another time. And I was like, man, fuck that. I was like, let's just fucking do it. I was like, I guarantee you I can get at least, like, four or five rolls off before he can hop in. His, he's going to try to run over here. I'm going to fucking get a bunch of rolls off. And then I'm going to hop in my car. He's going to have to run back to his car. I was like, I'm way faster than him. There's no way he's catching me. <laughs> And so then, yeah, I just started fucking chucking rolls of toilet paper into into this tree. We probably got, still got off probably 30 rolls before we had to fucking be lying out of there. It happened exactly like I said. He started to run over to us. We just were chucking them and then had the cars running. And then as soon as he got close enough, then we jumped in the cars and then he ran back to his car. And then he chased us for a long time. Got very, very reckless on the roads trying to get away from this maniac. <laughs> he was very mad about us. Toilet paper and a neighbor. <laughs> it's it's got. Kind of, I mean, it it's a funny. That's really funny because it's 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 a pain in the ass, obviously, to clean up. But dude, it's fucking toilet paper. Yeah, it's not the end of the world, man. Dude, I once it's we, the, it's we the, it's the most innocent sort of vandalism. We once um, one of our friends like went to a concert and we told him we were gonna mess up his neighborhood, and he was like, "Oh yeah, whatever." And we um, police taped off his entire neighborhood. Ah, the caution tape. We caution taped like the entrance to the place and the the <laughs> entrance and exit of the place. And then we did everybody's uh, driveway, went mailbox to mailbox to mailbox. And we police taped the entire neighborhood. <laughs> that was the uh, that was a game changer when uh, the caution tape. I don't know. I don't remember who and like and, and group of people I hung out with first got the caution tape, but it was a complete game changer. When you saw it, you're like, oh, this looks totally different to people. This isn't just like toilet paper. Yeah. This this is like alarm 
<laughs> yeah, it it's it's, it's very vibe. confusing when like you yeah. come outside and you see your it's driveway has been caution taped off <laughs> and the entrance and exit to the ro- your entrance to your building is like cut off you're like am i allowed to like drive through this or what is going on here yeah people are very m- much more hesitant to you know to just drive through that stuff they're not just going to assume everything's okay they're going to assume like something's wrong with the road or, you know, something like that. And so, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was hilarious. Like people would just like drive up and they would be unsure whether they could go home. <laughs> Jesus. It's a fun prank to do. Yeah. That's Especially when funny. there's no other way to get in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. You're, well, I guess we don't go home today. You, you remember, car. you remember when they tried to do that to us at, um, our uh apartment in, in Santa Monica where like they yeah, uh Jesus. they paved the road and then they like it was just, like you know seven eight in the morning and it's like we gotta go to fucking work man like they had the thing like our entrance ex to exit out of our apartment complex the garage and to go onto the road they had that blocked off it's like yeah dude no I gotta drive on this shit man we gotta, we gotta fucking go to work what are you talking about dude can't fucking do this at they, fucking like seven a.m. They, dude, when we lived off Santa Monica Boulevard, they tried to do that shit with Obama. Like Obama's in town, so everybody's standing outside, like wanting to wave at him and shit. I'm like, dude, I have to go home. Like yeah. I can't drive on this fucking road. Yeah. Like what the hell, man? I remember the like that uh, that night I ordered food and they literally couldn't bring it to me. So I had to cross the street to get to the delivery person. They're like, I don't know how to get it to you. So I just ran across the street. I got fucking screamed at by cops yeah. and they were going to shoot me. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I, I just pretended I had a family. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they just real. like, they, I, they're just like, yeah, don't, oh, don't worry. Go like 20 miles in the opposite direction yeah. and then yeah. go 30 miles south and then work yourself around. It's completely fine. Instead of just like going across the street. It's like, and, and it, it was, and he never came. He never came. He even never comes down that road. Never came down that road. They blocked it off purely because we were somewhat close to the 405. It's like, dude, like they blocked it off for like for most of the day. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I think it was like St. Patty's Day the day before or something because it, it was strange because I left my car like in Hollywood and I actually walked all the way there and drove back. And when I drove back, it's like, what is happening here? Like, what, what the fuck is this? And I remember just seeing like this look, people like <clears throat> had this look of like, I don't even know how to describe it, like reticence where they're just like, oh, he's coming. And I'm like, get the fuck out of my face. Like, and I, I remember the, the cops screaming at me because I, uh, he's like, you see anybody else crossing the street? And I just, I just went higher. I just went way bigger. Yeah. I was like, I can't feed my family. I don't get to feed. And, you know, like I don't have a fucking family. And like, I didn't then, but, uh. <laughs> I mean, he just ba- he just backed off, but I was just like, I just came bigger, yeah. And I just kept kept walking, and uh, but that I mean, that was fucking basically the end of it. I was it was very frustrating. It's like, dude, you know, there like, is no one coming. There is no one coming. We can see a mile down the road. There is no one there. Let me fucking go home, dude. Yeah, th- there there was no one allowed, and this is one of the busy what, busier streets in Santa Monica. No oh, man, super you know? frustrating. I mean, freaking, it's uh, what Highway sixty. 60- whatever 66 dude that's a long while like i walked once i remember walking from santa monica to hollywood just to see how far it was and how long it would take yeah, long. and yeah. it's a it's a long fucking walk i don't recommend i it. was i was really hung over and i was reading atlas shrugged so i was just like fuck it I'll i did it. i did it in way. work clothes like wearing like dress shoes and fucking, <laughs> shit. fucking shirt and pants and everything and i was Belt just like shit it's like this was a mistake. I should have fucking cab and this was before Uber and shit, or if Uber was around, it was very new. So it's like, man, I should have cabbed it. I was like, this was a horrible, horrible choice. But I was like, you know, I I was used to taking super long walks, so I was like, eh, let me see how long a walk this is. Yeah, I, I purely did it by choice, just because like I was I was enjoying the book I was reading, so I was like, I'll just read the whole way. I didn't have like shit else to do. It's like again, pre kids and shit where you don't really have shit to do. And I was super hungover from the night before. So I was just like, I'll just walk off this hangover and uh took a while, that's for sure. So lesson for everybody in the audience. Walks from Santa Monica to Hollywood if you're ever in Los <laughs> Angeles. Not as fun as you would think. 
not as fun <laughs> as you would think. And if there's a president in town, um, it could really screw up your plans. Yeah. Yeah. Real big so inconvenience. Be, be prepared. Be prepared for that. But Dude, that, but that's the biggest thing. I, I don't give a shit what the reason would be. The, the idea that now I don't get to go home. Yeah. What, are you fucking kidding me? Like, what, what world are we living in? Yeah, they literally black off the, the streets on your way home. As if, like, there's, you know, a million different ways you can get back to your house. This is completely ridiculous, man. It's like, like there's dude, there's no, no there, fucking there, there would be no you know, way to... Mario Brothers portals I can jump through. <laughs> there's only fucking one way I can get home, man. I have to go this way. Yeah, it, it's the main artery through that area. And if I can't take that road, I have to take another road, but I have to go through it the, to get the, to that the biggest, fucking road. The biggest man. problem is like you could go up and you could be like, all right, so when can I, when is this going to end? When I can, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that that's not good thing. enough for yeah, me, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were no answers. It was just like, well, we don't know. We have no, we have no ideas. But you know, but again, that that was the thing that fucking bothered me more than anything. Is like, I just look around and everybody else's faces. They're just like they're holding their kids because of this great moment. You're gonna watch a fucking car go by. Yeah, there was that's no it. car that went by. No car ever well, that, went but, fucking by. But that's but, but that's the reason they're out there is the idea that a car will go by and you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember that day I was out there. Yeah, and, you know, I can't. Yeah, I can't roll by. I can't walk across the street, but I can stand on the sidewalk. Like, how does this make any sense? <laughs> like, this is there is no logic behind this. Like, you're you're the internal fucking logic of your system makes no fucking sense. How am I? Not a danger standing here, but if I cross the street, then I'm suddenly the because most you, dangerous person on the planet. They don't know the exact moment that the cars could be coming. Yeah. And I, apparently they'll be going, yeah, they're going like miles an hour. 7,000 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a straight shot, man. I can see like a mile down the road. There's no cars coming. See, We're a, lot far, a lot farther than that. Shit. <laughs> But yeah, so what we got next week, we will get the interlude and the uh, thrice locked box and then things take a turn for the worse. And, Uh-oh. and we get uh, we might get to Denna's uh, song and they're falling out. And so come to the end of his time in um, in the city in Severin. So that yeah, so that OK. I, I forget about the the um, sort of how we get there, but yeah, I guess they have that first. Don't yeah, they? that's why this is the peak then, because it's a big yeah. fucking drop from here. He's going to spy on her, and then the very next thing is oh, he flips out yeah. on her. Yeah, we learn a lot. We learn a lot about Denna in that. Uh, in that, and then yeah, I guess right after that, he's he's off, right? Yeah, which is fucking great. That's that's. That's super cool. The whole thing with the uh, with the the group and the bandits and that whole uh, we get a lot there. It's pretty great. Yeah. So moving along, almost halfway halfway through uh, this book, we'll be probably halfway through next episode. Nice. But yeah, I think that's all we got on this one. And hope you guys got a lot of good advice at the end with you know on how to be annoyed about. Traffic and you know, not being across the street. How how to Hope be you learned annoyed? a lot. Yeah. <laughs> how to how to act annoyed. How to feel about not being allowed yeah. to go home. So, Although that came from first creating that situation for other people when you're younger, and then as you get older, having yeah. to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. That's like that's the that's the the, the yeah. It wasn't as funny right when there. when I was the recipient of it. <laughs> It was a lot funnier when I did it to other people and I blocked off their neighborhood and then they weren't sure if they could go home. Hilarious to me. Yeah. I love thinking about it from the different perspective, right? Yeah. (laughs) When When someone did it to to me, not so fucking funny. I had to get home. I had shit to do, man. Really fucking up my day. (laughs) Uh, And if someone toilet papered me, oh man, I'm going to want to murder you. (laughs) You just gave me a bunch of shit I got to do. What the fuck? Yeah. It's really funny, man. Yeah. The earlier times, it was like you're looking for things to do and to not be home. Yeah. So another life lesson. Do to others and don't let them do to you. (laughs) 
don't worry about the uh don't worry about the effects you yeah. know just just experience life do that but all right we will uh see you guys next week peace out yep Thank you.